morning everyone uh, so today we have k michaels founder of niche systems he is the founder of niche systems a consulting firm for the platform security and cryptography he is also co-founder of open source firmware foundation and immuni he earned a master's degree in computer security in 2018 from rur university bochum and has previously worked on gnu pg and sequoia so i'm right i believe pgp so i welcome you k so for the talk on the past present and the future of scaling of web3 thank you everyone um so yes uh, this first talk will be um, like a little historical overview of what has been done in like roughly last 10 years um, to scale blockchain of three to eight billion users. All right, um, I'm Kai. I'm uh, mostly into computer security. And uh, for me, at least, the most interesting areas for computer security is where security is an enabler, right? Um, so you don't want security to just be an add on, you just you want to security have to enable new products, new services. And uh, I think blockchain is one of these areas where security can still be an enabler. So if you search for like high gas fees or something like that on the internet, you find some pretty funny pictures. So this is an uh, unique swap swap where uh, we swap like roughly $35 in ETH and the gas fee is $24. So roughly 80% of the whole uh, value of the transaction is just burned away in gas fees. Uh, here's another example. This is like a $150 swap. Um, these examples are, of course, cherry picked, but um, because the capacity of a blockchain is um, like at least in the midterm limited. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, it's limited. When there's a high demand for block space, uh, transaction fees spike up and they stay there uh, elevated for uh, quite some time. This is not just an annoyance, but this has a real impact on the type of applications you can realize on Web3, right? Um, so this is an example here as Frentech, which has been like super popular a few weeks ago. Um, the basic idea is that this is an um, on-chain telegram but in order to join a channel, you have to like buy your ticket into that. And the ticket is an on-chain object, right? So you have to do an on-chain transaction in order to join, which means that in order to use Frentech, you have to have a wallet, you have to fund it with ETH, um, which means if you want to uh, use Frentech as somebody who's like not a crypto native, that is quite complicated, right? So Frentech is on base, so it's fairly good integrated into Coinbase, but still you have to explain to you, okay, you have to like get a Coinbase, buy some ETH, put the ETH that is in your Coinbase account into your Frentech wallet and they can use it, right? It's not really very useful uh, or very, very easy. Oh, good. Um, another example would be Farcaster, which is an on-chain Twitter. So uh, the basic idea is that your account and like all the important information associated with it are an, is an on-chain object. Um, so you, can, you are the only person that controls this data and it's open, right? You can move it to other um, other networks, other implementations, which is pretty cool. Um, but that means that if you want to open an account on, for example, as a swapcast, this is like the, um, the client for, for iOS, again, before you see anything, right, before you see the, your timeline or can understand like the, uh, how the product works and who's on there, you present it with, present it with a uh, screen that tells you, hey, please five, pay five bucks, right, in order to pay for the gas fee to generate your account. Um, and um, I think Podcast is pretty much the best implementation of that because it's an app. You can use Apple Pay, right? It's just like one button press away, and then you like have your um, have your uh, like in this case uh, gas fee paid. Um, but it's still like hard if you look at like, at least a high friction way to get people onto the product, right? If you compare this with what we have in Web two, where you first give your product away for free and like get people hooked, and then you have like the upsell. Um, which makes it way easier to do that instead of like just starting off with it. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, and then you look at the price, right? Five bucks for a year. 
Um, if you look at what I can buy on AWS in terms of servers, so the cheapest server or like the cheapest VM you can get there is like roughly twenty dollars a year, right? And um, I would say that one of these VMs can support more than four users for a year, right? Um, obviously, I understand that like doing this on chain has additional benefits. It's not just some server running somewhere, um, but and I can understand that this costs a bit more, but maybe it doesn't have to cost orders of magnitude more. Okay. Um, so what can we do to make this a bit cheaper, right? And the first thing you have to look at how these blockchains work and why this has to be so expensive. Um, okay, this is the Web3 track. I assume everybody has like a rough understanding how this blockchain stuff works. I will just like give a short overview um, in this case for, block, uh, for Bitcoin. Um, so we have a bunch of nodes which are just computers um, and they're connected on some kind of network like the internet. And um, if I want to do something on this network, like for example, send money from A to B, I create a new transaction, I sign that transaction, um, I send it to one of those nodes, and the node would uh, then broadcast this transaction over the network. Um, each of these nodes uh, receives the transaction, verifies the transaction that the, like, the transaction by itself makes sense, and then after all the nodes have received this uh, transaction, the mining process starts. And the mining process is effectively just everybody racing to mine the next block. and. Uh, this mining process randomly selects one of the winners who will then like produce the next block, which includes my transaction and all the other transactions that has been collected during the time. And then we uh, broadcast the block. Everybody receives the block. Everybody verifies the block. And if they're happy with it, the cycle repeats. Um, so if there's a network interruption, um, blockchains are on the availability side of the cap theorem. So the system continues working. Um, but we have a split world, right? So we have, like, in this case, two worlds, one with two nodes, one with three nodes, and uh, the mining process in this case will select one of the winners in both worlds. And uh, once this um, interruption is uh, resolved, there will be a mer they, they will merge their state, but not in the sense that they are, there's a superset, but one of these states will win. Um, and in the case of Bitcoin, will be probably the one with the three nodes because there has been more. Um, computational energy put into their state than the one, the other one. Okay, so a few observations here. Um, every node in the Bitcoin network has to verify every transaction, right? So, so there's a lot of uh, superfluous uh, verification and computation going on. Also, all the state has to be distributed across the whole network. There are optimizations in order. Uh, to allow me that after I've uh, verified something, I can at least throw or, or like prune the state. But there has to be at least some nodes in the network that keep the whole state. So in order when new networks join the network, um, I can retrieve the whole state and verify it myself. Um, the network has to proceed in lockstep, right? So um, there's not much parallelization going on. Everybody collects these transactions. They have to be broadcast. Then everybody races to mine a new block. Um, then the block has to be distributed, and this is then the whole cycle repeats. Right? Uh, we cannot like um, combine these steps in any way. There's no real uh, parallelization going on, um, which means that adding nodes to the network doesn't really extend or like increases the capacity of the network. It does to some extent, but um, it trades off pretty fast. Um, it also means that the speed of the network, the capacity of the network is pretty much limited by the smallest node that is uh, a member of this network. Um, I cannot slow down the network by becoming a node and then just doing less work than I have to. Uh, it will just be left behind, but um, there's, there's no um, like additional benefit from adding like larger nodes if there are still smaller nodes in the network. Um, and uh, yeah, and then there's this mining process, right? This is like, ironically, of all the inefficiencies, um, I talked about this is what like people concentrate on is this mining work, which is effectively just busy work in order to select randomly select one of these block producers um, without much synchronization going on. And uh, so the first solution for this mining process was uh, we just uh, stopped doing it. And um, the idea came up like roughly 2011 called proof of stake. We were saying, okay, instead of having this mining process. Um, we have a different way of synchronization, and in order to prevent people from just generating blocks that are invalid, um, everybody has to put up some kind of stake, some kind of a, a fidelity bond that is um, 
taken over by the network if they are caught doing something that is against the protocol rules. Um, this was later then um, formalized into a few uh, blockchain implementations, for example, Algorand or um, Cardano, where they have even uh, security proofs for the system. Um, but if you look at the system, it pretty much works the same as the proof of work version in Bitcoin. Um, we have a node that generates a transaction. The transaction is broadcast across the network. But then, instead of mining something, the uh, algorithm in the proof of stake system has selected one of the block proposers in this case in advance. Um, and the block proposer knows that he's the block proposer and uh, he will generate a block and uh, broadcast the block over the network. And then everybody can verify that, okay, this block is valid and this block was created by the block proposer. So there's no mining going on, but everything else is still the same. Uh, which means that uh, proof of stake can only, in a very limited way, increase the capacity of a blockchain, right? So the, the core um, problems that we have to distribute the state across the whole network and everybody has to verify all the transaction, we still have that. Um, there's some um, alternative, uh, well, not alternative, but improvement on the system called an asynchronous BFT algorithm. Um, implementation would be, for example, uh, Phantom and um, Hedera Hashgraph, where there's a limited amount of parallelization going on. So um, these blocks and this uh, mining process, is one of the main goals is to order all the transaction in the global ordering. Um, and um, with these asynchronous AB BFTs, I, as a node, collect already transactions and put it into local ordering, and I distribute this local ordering. And then there are some clever graph algorithms going on that combine these local orderings into a global ordering that is then um, uh, the same across all the nodes. Uh, but this is a very limited amount of um, uh, of uh, asynchronous going on, so you still have blocks, you still have the network pretty much running in lockstep. Okay, so in order to make the system really more efficient, um, we have to uh, essentially use the blockchain less and build stuff on top of the blockchain, um, which are like in combined known as uh, layer two solutions. Okay, um, the first layer two solution starts with a very really simple question. Um, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's here around to, around to hear it, does it make a sound? Maybe everyone can like think about this for a second. <laughs> okay, um, the blockchain interpretation of this would be if two people exchange money, why does the whole world need to know, right? I mean, if you look at it from uh, in, in the physical world, if like two people exchange cash, they don't have to like broadcast this fact to everybody else, right? Um, and um, maybe you can learn something from that in the blockchain world. And uh, the first idea uh, implementation of this was the Lightning Network for Bitcoin, where um, we limit the amount of transactions we put onto the blockchain. So we have here Alice with the fancy glasses and Bob in the cat suit and we have the Bitcoin network over there. And um, they decide they want to exchange money using the Lightning Network and what they do is they create something called a funding transaction where they both put up money, like for example one Bitcoin and um, put it in some kind of shared pot. Uh, and this is funding transaction that this has to be broadcast on network. So we pay gas fees for that. Um, but what they then can do is exchange the, the pot of money uh, between them, right? So everybody, both of them put like one Bitcoin in and then one party can pay from this pot the other party, right? And um, for each of these payments, we create a commitment transaction um, that effectively um, allows the, both parties to receive their money out of this pot, but we don't broadcast this to the, trans to the Bitcoin network, just we keep this for ourselves. And only if we want to, oh, sorry, we want to close the channel, we broadcast the last commitment transaction to the blockchain and tell the blockchain, okay, like this is like how the state is after our commitment transaction. This is like the last known world state. Um, and this way we can like have uh, ex ex uh, exchanges here that don't have to be broadcast to the, to the blockchain. It can be like a billion different commitment transactions, but we only broadcast the last. So we only have like two um, fees we have to pay once to set up the, this channel, what they call it, and once to close it. Um, 
I would like super briefly tell you how this works because I think it's pretty neat. Um, the basic idea if is you have this funding transaction here where we start off with, and then we have these commitment transactions we create and these spend from the funding transaction, right? So everybody puts like one Bitcoin in and we create uh, commitment transactions, there are always two of them. So uh, one of them is Alice, commitment transaction that she can send to the blockchain. And then one is from Bob. Um, and Alice transaction just says, okay, Bob get his money back immediately, but Alice has to wait some kind of time. Uh, and the time is measured in blocks produced. Um, and then there's the mirror transaction for Bob, right? So Bob's transaction, the, the transaction Bob can send to the blockchain, um, Bob has to wait for his money, but Alice gets her money immediately. And um, in order to spend this money or do a, do a transaction on this on this pot, you just create a new set of commitment transactions. So let's say we pay 0.2 Bitcoin from uh, Alice to Bob, then both then we create a new pair of these transactions. In this case, um, we have one where Alice has 0.8 um, and uh, Bob gets 0.2, and again, there, there are pairs of them. Um, that each of those can close the channel, um, but depending on who sends it, um, then the, they have to wait and the other party gets the money immediately. And we also create an revoc revocation transaction for the previous community transaction. I will explain this a bit later. Um, so in the best case, if everybody is um, correctly executing the protocol, we have this funding transaction that is committed to the blockchain and then we have the last commitment transaction. So we both put in one Bitcoin, and then later we close the channel with the updated um, updated balances. And it doesn't really matter, right? Others can can send a transaction, or Bob doesn't uh, doesn't change the fact. Um, but now, is of course, the question: um, Alice could try to defraud Bob, right, by sending the old commitment transaction where she, she still has one Bitcoin instead of 0.8. Um, and this is what this revocation transaction is for. What Bob can do is he can monitor the blockchain and can see, hey, wait a second, Alice sent this uh, revoked tra commitment transaction to the blockchain, and then he can use this revocation um, transaction to steal Alice's money, right? So because Alice has to still has to wait a few blocks before she gets the money out of this transaction, Bob can use the other transaction to steal the money before this happens. Um, and effectively punish Alice for uh, violating the protocol. So, in conclusion, the basic idea is, first, we limit the amount of interaction of transactions we send to the blockchain. Uh, instead, we have a local um, history of what has happened that we can then later use to update the blockchain or in the case there is some kind of fraud to prove that we are the uh, party that followed the protocol correctly and the other party violated it. Um, this kind of mirrors the clearing and um, settlement system we have in TradFi, right? So when you pay something with a credit card, it first goes through the clearing, which takes a few seconds. Um, but in order for the transaction to settle, to the mon for the money to actually go from your bank account to the vendor's bank account, this takes like days to weeks. Um, and during this time, the transaction is uh, just exists as some data database entry in the, in the clearinghouse. Um, that's all cool, right? We have solved the problem. Um, the problem is it is unclear how to extend this to something that is not a payment, right? So the real um, benefit of blockchain is that you can have general computation on them, right? For example, Ethereum has a smart contract platform. Um, how to do this system with something that is like just a program instead of just a payment um, was an open question for a long time. Um, it's already the next uh, idea where uh, um, first packed side chains and later then um, refined into plasma chains, where the idea is you just have multiple blockchains with different trade-offs. So uh, in this case, we have uh, Ethereum, which is our slow and expensive, but very decentralized and secure chain called the root chain in this context. And um, then we have uh, the Polygon here as example. There are other implementations, but Polygon is like the canonical example of this. Um, there is a smaller chain with less decentralization and lower gas fees, but also lower security, presumably. And um, the idea is that uh, the plasma chain receives the state from the root chain. So the plasma chain always knows what's the last latest block in the root chain. Um, then the plasma chain runs its own consensus algorithm, 
which is tuned towards speed um, and low fees. So for example, you could just have lower decentralization, less blocks, le less nodes that have higher capacity, or you have something like proof of authority where we say, okay, um, all the participants in this like smaller blockchain are known and we trust them so we can lower the um, requirements on verification for transactions. Um, and it's not like everybody can join that network. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is, it just has to be uh, faster than what we do in the root chain. And then we commit these blocks we create on this plasma chain and send it back, send it back to the root chain um, as some kind of commitment. Okay, we say, okay, this is a new block, we put this into root chain and then um, this block is like settled. Um, there's no verification done here really, it's just we put it in there and then we say, okay, that's the last dead, uh, state. So, basic idea is, right, we have like a high security, high decentralization, high fee system here uh, the, in our root chain, and then we have the low security, lower decentralization, but higher throughput and lower fees um, chain on the other side. And the basic idea is you can use the plasma chain to pay for your coffee, but you can use the root chain to pay for your house, and uh, you can have these different trade-offs and decide which one is current, currently the better, the better uh, protocol to use. Um, and uh, the whole reason why we connect these chains together is so we can move assets between them automatically, right? Um, so uh, Bob, uh, yeah, Bob can deposit his some kind of asset, for example, ETH, into some smart contract on the root chain. This state update is sent to the Plasma chain. Plasma chain sees, oh, okay, somebody has um, deposited something, and then the Plasma chain can credit you that asset or a mirrored version of this asset on the Plasma chain then you can use that and the plasma chain can then burn it, like send it to some address where there's no private key known for. Um, and then later there can be a proof submitted to the root chain. So yes, this has been burned on the plasma chain so you can um, retrieve it from the smart contract on the root chain. Okay. Um, this allows us to have different blockchains with different trade-offs, but doesn't solve the core problem, right? We have still had this, these are still blockchains, right? Uh, we still do redundant computation. We still have to distribute the whole state across the whole network. Um, so the, the, the core inefficiencies are not really solved. Um, the next idea was to actually do things off the chain um, using something called a roll-up. There are two types of roll-ups. There are the optimistic ones and the um, zero-knowledge ones. Um, because Arbitrum, one of our sponsors here, um, it's an optimistic roll-up, and uh, they paid for my breakfast. We're going to start with them. Um, so in the off, and uh, in the optimistic roll-up version, we again have a blockchain that uh, we assume is safe and secure, and then we have off-chain components. Um, and the off-chain component here means it's just some server running somewhere by some guy um, that we don't really trust. Uh, we know it's there, and there uh, we can verify what they do. Um, but we don't have to trust them. Um, and there are two of them. There's the sequencer, sometimes also called the batcher, and uh, then there's the state function or state transitioning function or a proposer. Um, and the basic idea is in order to use the rollup, you send your transactions to the sequencer, and the sequencer batches them up and commits them on, as one block into the um, like underlying blockchain. And this is the first way you can save on transaction fees, right, instead of everybody as well as submitting their transaction to the blockchain and paying the fee, um, you do it once in one batch, right? Um, obviously, we don't want to... Oh, right, so, and then we have the state function that reads these committed transaction uh, transactions plus the previous state and uh, computes the next state. And again, the state is committed to the uh, underlying blockchain. So, uh, of course, we don't want to tr have to trust these systems, so... Uh, if the sequencer, for example, is down or it just refuses to accept your transaction, um, everybody has still the option to directly submit their transaction to the smart contract on the blockchain. Um, this obviously it's um, uh, expensive, right? Because you have to pay the gas fees in this case, but uh, you cannot be censored by the sequencer. Okay, but uh, what about the state transitioning function, right? This is way more important. What if this thing does something wrong and, for example, includes my transaction, but doesn't execute it or executes it wrong. Um, and um, so if you look at the state transitioning function, right, it's pretty simple. We have the list of transactions that goes in as input. We have the previous state that goes in. 
And uh, then we have the function in the middle, which is known, right? Everybody knows the transitioning function. It's part of the system, um, and, it's, and it's deterministic. So uh, what I can do if I have the feeling that the off-chain version of the state transitioning function did something wrong, I can challenge that. So I have to put up a bond first uh, in order to make the system um, not uh, abusable. But uh, then you can say, wait a second. Um, this last state that you produced, I think this is wrong. This should be the state. So you put up your alternative interpretation of the word. Um, and then what we do is effectively run the state transitioning function on chain. So the whole thing that has been done off chain uh, for efficiency reason, we do it once on chain for this particular state transition. Um, this is a gross uh, simplification of what we actually do. So in reality, there's a game that runs before that where I and the um, off-chain state transitioning function figure out, okay, which is the exact instruction that we disagree on, and we only run this instruction on the blockchain. Um, but uh, this is just an optimization, right? Um, from a conceptual point of view, you can imagine, okay, we run this transitioning function on-chain once, because the assumption is running it on-chain um, is something that nobody else can manipulate. And once we decide, okay, who was right here, uh, we can continue with the off-chain computation. Um, so this, yeah, these are the optimistic rollups, right? We assume the off-chain components are um, truthful to their words, right? They do everything right, um, but we leave the door open to challenge this. Um, the other implementation would be a pessimistic rollup, um, where we eagerly verify each of these new states. Um, I'm only going to explain this like a little bit here, or very brief, because yesterday we had a talk from Leo, right? That all explained CK in uh, very much detail. So I guess you guys are all experts now. Um, but the basic idea is we still have a sequencer, which is also uh, off-chain. But instead of this block proposal, we have the prover. And uh, the prover gets the transaction set uh, from the sequencer and um, does the state transitioning, uh, computes the next state, but it also computes a cryptographic proof. And this proof um, is, can, can be verified and make sure that um, the prover has followed this state transitioning protocol correctly, right? Um, and then the um, smart contract can verify that. And um, if the proof is correct, it accepts the, accepts the next state and everything's fine. Um, okay, why don't we always do that, right? I mean, isn't it way easier to do this like on-chain uh, fraud-proof thing with the with the uh, state transitioning function, and with that we have in the optimacy rollups? Well, um, so collecting enough transactions for the next state takes a sequence of maybe a minute. Um, creating this cryptographic proof takes an hour, two hours. Um, so it's very computational intensive, and uh, that's why we can fix this problem a bit using just more provers, right, paralyzing the, the operation. Um, but it's still it's a very expensive operation. And this is why, at least for the CK protocols we have now, we are just on the edge of something that's actually practical. Um, so there's still a lot of research going into these things. But uh, they seem to be like the best way forward here. OK, last one, data availability. Um, so. If you look at like back at the rollups, uh, we use rollups for two things, right? We use them for execution, doing this uh, fraud proof thing or doing the um, CK proof verification, um, and for just bulk data storage, right? For the like list of transactions, we dump them in there, um, not really to store it, but to just have a commitment to this transaction um, and have a where a uh, place where we can store them where it can cannot be deleted later, right? Because if you want to do this fraud proof thing, you have to be able to retrieve the previous data. Um, and uh, Ethereum wasn't really built to be a bug data storage. Um, I will skip this in the, uh, to save a bit of time, but the basic idea is there have been some improvements um, in like mid-March this year, having a new transaction type, which makes it a bit cheaper to have this data, right? so we, instead of packing the data in transaction, we just have it as, as an attached thing, and we only have some commitment that's in the transaction, which makes the whole thing like one order of magnitude cheaper, roughly. Um, well, at least it did until like a few days ago. So this is the uh, graph of the, of the fees we have to pay for this new uh, transaction type. So it stayed at ze effectively zero for a long time, but then later, 
people figure out, hey, we can use this for other stuff, and suddenly um, we are on the upside for the for the blob fees too. So this doesn't seem to be like a long-term solution here. Um, what is probably more of a long-term solution is to have something called the data availability layer, where we have a dedicated blockchain that is only there for data storage. So instead of having a smart contract platform in there and being able to execute um, whatever program you want to, um, these kinds of blockchains, they only receive messages. Messages have a namespace. This is what they are color, color coded here. Um, and then they have some uninterpreted bulk data attached to it um, that we don't really, like the blockchain doesn't really care about it. Um, and what we can later do is to uh, use that as a, as data storage for these rollups, right? So in this optimistic rollup, for example, you had the sequence that it would like just dump the transaction list onto this data availability layer, and only the important things like the next state maybe would be put onto the uh, Ethereum blockchain, saving a lot of uh, transaction fees and making the system um, a lot cheaper. All right, in conclusion. Um, so we start off with improving on the consensus algorithm itself, right? Going from proof of work to proof of stake, trying to make the proof of stake mechanism as efficient as possible. Um, but uh, later we went to more, uh, like more chains, right? Having different uh, trade-offs for different chains, um, and trying to make the system a bit more efficient this way. And then we later moved on to off-chain components, right? We have this um, batching and delay consensus mechanism that you have with rollups. And um, at least for the future, it seems to be that um, we're going towards the CK um, solution, right? Because the CK solution solves the two big problems, right? We have first can, can generate a proof that uh, some kind of off-chain components followed the protocol correctly, right? We do only the verification on-chain. And second, um, because of the zero-knowledge um, properties, you can have inputs into your smart contracts that you don't have to reveal, right? So you can even um, process private data on the blockchain, even though everybody can see the state. Not everyone can see all your inputs. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> 10 seconds for questions. Any questions to ask Kai? Yes. OK, thank you very much, Kai, for the session. We'll move with the next session. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah today's speaker is Mohit Bhatt, who is a lead blockchain engineer at Singularity. Yesterday, we both met together in the community meet. Mohit Bhatt is a distinguished full-stack blockchain engineer with a rich background in the blockchain sector, currently leading the lead blockchain engineer at Singularity Singapore. His extensive involvement in the open source program is marked by significant contributions as a project admin and mentor at the C2SA organization for the Google Summer of Code along with participations in the summer of Bitcoin, GitHub externship, and Ethereum fellowship. As a certified Ethereum developer, Mohit has a commendable track record of success in over 30 hackathons and awards, showing his expertise and innovative approach in the field. His passion for blockchain technology extends to heavy contributions in both Web2 and Web3 open source project, highlighting his commitment to the advancement and development of blockchain technologies. Welcome, Mohit, for the talk. Yeah, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on decoding open source in Web3, uh, leveraging open source solutions for Web3 challenges. So uh, I am Mohit, and I am the project admin and mentor at Google Summer of Code for the C2SI organization. And uh, I'm also the lead blockchain engineer at Singularity. In past, I have been the part of GSOC, uh, the Google Summer of Code, as a student, like past four or five years back. And then I am the admin now. 
and uh, now also i'm the part of summer of bitcoin which is for the bitcoin fellowships and uh, the open source programs and of course the github externships as well So uh, let's get started with the session. So the first question that comes to everyone's mind is like, why open source in Web3? OK, uh, I know like there are a lot of students here. And they ask me this question, like, why uh, we should do open source? OK, uh, some people say we should do open source in Web2. Some say like we should do open source in Web3. But the main agenda comes like, what's the benefits? One, some, some people do this for. Uh, uh, for passion, but most of you want it for like some reason to do it. So the first thing is like Web3 is inherently open source. So what I mean by this. So see what exactly is Web3. Web3 is basically a kind of blockchain. It's a decentralized database, a ledger, which is like basically controlled by a set of nodes, computers. You can just, if, if I talk in layman terms, uh, Web3 just means basically uh, like uh, there are a lot of computers around the world which is storing data and these computers are basically running a software, a client software, which is like written by a set of people, random people around the world. Who are they? They are basically the open source developers. So you just have to run a client software to connect to the network and these are all maintained by the open source developers. Uh, you might go to the Bitcoin GitHub repo, you can go to the Ethereum GitHub repo. They all are like uh, maintained by uh, open source developers. There is no particular organization which is controlling that uh, uh, particular source code and all that stuff. Uh, and now talking about like dApps, I want to take this first because uh, it's very important to know like when you are contributing to some uh, applications or as a developer, what are the things that are present in uh, that particular technology? So initially, like in Web2, we had this storage backend and the front end. The storage was the MongoDB, Firebase, that where you store the data. Then there was the back end, which was written in Node, Python, and all those things. And then there was the front end. So these are the applications you might be building as of now, when as a web developer and a, as an app developer. But in uh, like uh, in Web3, what comes new stuff is like the blockchain. So blockchain is basically the storage layer where you store the data. Okay, and then comes the smart contracts. Smart contracts uh, act as a, like the back end of the uh, uh, this uh, whole uh, application that you build. So now the blockchain is replacing the storage layer. Back end is being replaced by the smart contracts, which contains all the stuff. And this is written in Solidity, Viper, and Rust. So these are the main languages where you can contribute. So if you want to contribute as a smart contract developer, or as an auditor, as a security person, you need to learn Solidity, Viper, and Rust. If you want to work on the protocol itself, if you if you want to like contribute to the blockchain itself, the source code of blockchain, then those are written in C++, Python, Java, and mostly the Rust again. Okay, so this this is these are the main things. And then comes the node provider. So node provider is nothing. It is the way to connect to the blockchain and then uh, build your application. And then there is the front end. So front end is like that you build. If you are a front end developer, you are already a blockchain developer. OK, so you just need to learn the blockchain aspect, the blockchain stuff. And you are ready to be an open source developer. You are ready to be a developer in the ecosystem. So yeah, uh, now the second part comes like why uh, open source in Web3. The second part is for the build for community. So when you, uh, what I do basically personally, uh, when I am like building something and I found, OK, uh, there is no tool for this particular application. There is nothing for this stuff. Let's build a library for it. Let's build something for it. And that is what I mean by build for community. So you have anything in your mind. You just saw like how Web3 works. You found out that Web3 is not working as per the goals, or there is no tool for it or there is a problem, there is a scalability issue, there is this particular issue. So what you can do is basically, you can just build a tool for it, you can build a project out of it, and just publish in the community. You just put a GitHub repo on the market and just put it on your Twitter, LinkedIn, and it has a huge impact. I personally have built some libraries 
which are being used by a lot of people uh, based on IPFS 5.0 network. How I did that? I just found out, OK, there is, uh, uh, there is no library for this particular thing. And then I build it. And now the community like looks behind me. And then uh, there is another way to build the portfolio. So many students ask me, oh, we have learned Web3. Uh, we have learned this thing. Uh, now what to do next? How to find the projects? Uh, I, I don't get ideas. So I would say go into the open source development. Okay, You just contribute to uh, that. I will talk about some platforms where you can contribute. You can contribute to our organization as well, which is an open source organization. So just contribute to these projects. And uh, you can mention all of those things in your resume as well. And it has a, in Web3, uh, an open source developer has like uh, uh, a great benefit. So there is a lot of hiring that happens on open source contribution basis. So if you are an open source developer, uh, people like companies directly hire you. Okay, you have already contributed to this code base. You are already a great uh, uh, like they know like you know all those things, and they just hire you. So it's a great way to build portfolio if you want to build resume. It's a it has a lot of hiring if, if you are looking for a job or something. It has those benefits as well. And then comes the networking, grants, funding, and airdrops. So this is the another huge benefit of it. So uh, uh, in Web3, this is like the, the best part of open source development. Like if you have built some tool, OK, if you have built something, you can get a grant for it. There is Ethereum Foundation here. There is uh, many other foundations as well. So if you have built something very good for the community as an open source good, you can take a grant and keep continuing that project for a long time. And then there is like uh, funding opportunities as well. If your project is very good, uh, you can get a funding for it. And uh, uh, they support you for all directions. In Web3, you get a lot of support for the open source development. And sometimes you get the airdrops as well. So what are airdrops? Basically, uh, uh, it's just like if you have contributed to some good code base, uh, you just basically uh, get some uh, tokens for that blockchain. So recently, a lot of people in the StarkNet, there is a StarkNet blockchain. So a lot of GitHub developers in the StarkNet ecosystem uh, got this airdrop. Uh, it was around like, uh, I would say $10,000, $20,000 just for the GitHub contributions. So that is also uh, something great and exciting stuff in the Web3 part. Uh, and then it's, of course, challenging and exciting. You will learn a lot of things. And it's a great way to boost your knowledge as well. So you will learn a lot of things. Uh, you will learn how to write better code, how to uh, write all the better stuff. So yeah. Uh, so. So for the benefits for uh, contribution of like open source and for the organizations, that was the part for the students and the developers. So for the organizations, as I said, Web3 is almost 90 to 95 percent uh, like uh, uh, open source itself by nature. But uh, if some company is not an open source organization, the benefits, uh, you should go for open source because uh, the benefits you get is like community collaboration and innovation. So usually you will find like five, six developers who will like code on your product. But if you make those things open source for a whole community, for a whole, uh, all the people around the world, you will see like you, are, you will already build community because they will tell everyone, OK, how, how this all stuff works. If they are like contributing to that project, they will automatically give a word of mouth for your product. And also, like uh, it allows other organizations to work directly with your ecosystem. So you will get all the support, customer support, uh, ecosystem support very fast. And the next part is like the transparency and trust. In Web3, it's very important that your product has trust factor in the market. So it's not like Web2 where you can just post, uh, you can just publish a product and you are closed source or everything. If you are not open source, if your code is not open for the public, it is very difficult to generate that trust. So I will not uh, like uh, work on something. I will not use a token or uh, uh, like a website which doesn't tell me like what exactly they are doing behind the scenes. So you have to make that all code base and all the contracts mostly open source because that is how uh, uh, Web3 would like to trust you because automatically all the code base is 
uh, open. And then also it uh, tells it helps you in the auditing and review. So you know there are a lot of hacks that happen in the Web3. So if, if you are like uh, uh, like uh, you have like put all your code open and there are a lot of contributors around the world, they will tell you all the bugs. Uh, it, it will automatically go in the bug bounty and all those aspects because people will automatically find the issues that that particular smart contract or the particular website has and uh, they will automatically contribute to it. And then of course there is cost savings and flexibility so it will automatically reduce your cost. You don't have to hire a big team. Uh, that is a very uh, important aspect in the Web3. We don't want to burn money. Okay, We want to save money and we want to build something better for the future. So uh, it also helps you in the cost savings and it also provides you the flexibility uh, because uh, uh, there is like everyone contributing to your code base. So uh, the next part is basically uh, how to start contributing to the Web3 open source. This is specifically for the students and the developers. So the first thing I would suggest you like make sure you have a good grasp of the tech programming language uh, you want to like work on. Uh, many people just after like the, doing this session, they will just go and start contributing to some readme or something. That is not the good way. You should first learn what exactly is blockchain. It will not take more than one or two months. Uh, learn about the solidity, rust, and all those stuff. Uh, not exactly rust. You can go for Bitcoin, Ethereum networks, and the solidity. There are a lot of resources present on the internet. And once you have done that, go on the platforms to start contributing. OK, so I will tell you about a lot of platforms where there are open issues present. Uh, you get like. Uh, uh, like uh, the tokens when you like contribute to it, you get like paid for those so solving those issues, and th those platforms are the best part. And then there is like understand uh, first of all uh, on these platforms or the GitHub repo of Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any kind of blockchain, Polygon or something. You can go there, understand their project, find the issues. You will find all the good first issues listed on these uh, repositories. And then, of course, write the code, get review, test your code. Uh, if, it, if it's a big uh, issue you, that you are solving, uh, try to do a security check and audit. And of course, like once merged, share in public. Sharing in public is very important. People will know you, OK, you have contributed to something good. And it will help you as a developer. And it will help that organization as well uh, by, uh, uh, like, they will be like known by, OK, there are all contributors around the world which are contributing to it. So yeah, now the next part is like my own uh, score lab organization, which is the part of Google Summer of Code. So uh, we are like a part of uh, open source organization for a, uh, uh, of Google Summer of Code for a long time. Uh, we have been, uh, uh, Till now, we have like 100 plus contributors around the world which are contributing to our projects. We have like 50 plus projects across uh, various domains like AI, Web3, Cloud, Web Dev. Uh, if you are a web developer, you can contribute to it, Clouds. And we have like 20 plus research publications till now. And also, as I said, we are a part of Google Summer of Code. Uh, this year's date have already gone, but you can contribute for next year. And uh, uh, it's a like, great way to start your open source journey. So uh, some of the projects that we have is like, uh, these are a lot of projects. Like we have Scanit, which is based on Kubernetes. Uh, we have like Label Lab, which is an image analyzing and classification platform. Uh, we have like this OpenMF, which are like the forensic tools. So if you are interested in any of these projects, you can like basically uh, contribute to it. We have like a lot of projects. We build basically tools for the community, for the uh, developers. It's not like very hard to contribute to these projects. Some of the projects are very big, but most of the projects are like uh, very beginner friendly. And you can just start contributing tomorrow as well. If you are already a web dev, you can contribute to Survey6. It has like front end component, React, Next.js, and all those stuff. 
Uh, in Web3 blockchain, we have this uh, NFT toolbox project uh, and the Web3 Stash library. NFT toolbox project uh, has been for like last two years and Web3 Stash, I started in a hackathon and then now it's an open source project. So you can also suggest your own open source projects to our uh, organization. Uh, we like would love to help you grow your project with us. And uh, 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 there are like more coming soon, like the next year, uh, in the next two years. So a little bit about the NFT toolbox project. It's an NPM package for seamless integrations of NFT related functionalities for the web two. So you all know that, uh, we have, we need basically web three and, uh, uh, many web two organizations who want to issue coupons as NFTs, the airlines and the other web two, uh, projects who want to like leverage the web three functionalities and issue tokens or NFTs, uh, as a marketing stuff, uh, they don't have like a no code tool for the web three. So we have built this library, uh, which is like, you don't have to learn anything about the NFTs. Uh, you just have to instantiate the library. Uh, we have this whole engine working behind the scenes. You can generate images automatically and then uh, you can put a lot of images and it will basically automatically uh, transfer it to the file storage systems like IPFS, Arweave and other stuff. And uh, then it will basically create the NFTs on any kind of blockchain you want. We are like adding supports for Solana, Near, and other kind of blockchains. And we are also providing like batch minting support with the best algorithms. So it's an easy to use NPM library that you can leverage. Uh, so the next part is basically about the Web3 Stash project. So this is my personal favorite project. Uh, the Web3 Stash project is about like the storage layer. So you all know that uh, there is like IPFS, NFT.storage, Web3.storage. These service providers are there, which basically like allow you to upload data to the decentralized storage networks. So what we have done is like uh, there is a problem with all these service providers is that uh, you have to learn about their documentation. You have to learn about their, uh, like syntax. They have a totally different syntax to do the same operation. So to solve that stuff, what we did, we made a common library where you can just provide the service name, like, which is basically, uh, if you want to use Pinata, just provide the Pinata as a service name. If you want to provide NFT dot storage, if you want to use NFT storage, just provide the service name as NFT dot storage. In config, you need to pass the API key and the API token, and that's it. This is a single line that you need to change if you want to switch between the providers. And then you can just call the same function on all the providers. So service.uploadjson, service.uploadimage, upload video. We have also added like support for uh, uploading, uh, chunk uploading of big videos and photos that is not yet supported in these, uh, uh, these service providers. So we provide you with that functionality. If you want to upload directly from AWS or, uh, from the other stuff. So, uh, this is like, and you can also contribute to this because this is written in JavaScript. You need, of course, the knowledge of, uh, uh blockchain providers and the decentralized storage networks, but this is like, uh, uh easy for like the beginners as well. Uh, about the node cloud project, this is not on web three, but I want to take this because I started my journey in open source from this project. So the node cloud project is again, a library for the cloud services. So you might have used AWS and, uh, uh, this Google cloud and other stuff. Uh, though, so what we did is like, again, we have built a library, which it's kind of Terraform where you can control all the services in your cloud through this library itself. And this is again, common for all the cloud providers. So you don't have to, if you want to migrate data from Google cloud to AWS, you can easily do, do that with this, uh, library. If you want to uh, use Azure Cosmos DB, but, uh, want to like, uh, run your application on AWS EC2, you can do this. You can do that with the node cloud project. And the best part of this, uh, uh, project is like the class generator module. So what I mean, the class generator module, uh, so 
you know, like in these cloud SDKs, there are a lot of services and they have like a lot of classes and functions. So to write, to rewrite those things manually in your library, it's very difficult, right? So what we did is like we made a class generator module, which is a magic module. So what it basically does, you need to write a transformer parser. We basically write a plugin that is called transformer parser and the extractor. Once we have wrote that plugin, what it does basically, it basically just after the cloud SDKs, it will basically just automatically find the type definition files in the project, parse it, convert into an abstract syntax tree, uh, do the data extraction. And once the data extraction is done, it will automatically generate classes for all the services. So you don't have to write everything manually uh, or you don't have to write all those classes manually in your uh, SDK. You just have to create this transformer parser, which is the plugin. You just have to create the plugin. And once plugin is created, if new services get added to the cloud SDK, it will automatically parse those files and it will convert into the JavaScript classes that is needed by the node cloud uh, library. So this is like the unique thing that we have developed uh, in our organization. And it has been used by a lot of people now. Uh, it is being used by the other open source organization as well as a uh, very important project. So if you are interested to contribute to the Google Summer of Code and you want to join the C2SI Score Lab channel, you can scan this. Uh, this is a Slack channel where you will learn everything and uh, uh, there's like all the stuff present there. Uh, and uh, when you are contributing to like the Web3 open source, I would say it's very important. Uh, it's, uh, it's very important to create uh, secure and secure dApps, which is like a very important aspect. So I will quickly take this uh, stuff. So if you want, if you are doing contributions to Score Lab or any open source organization, it's very important that you use, you use the tested open source libraries like Open Zeppelin and uh, other uh, like important libraries that are well tested in the market. Just don't co copy from Chat GPT or random code on the internet because there are a lot of hacks that happen. Use open source tools like Foundry, Hard Hat to battle test your code. Uh, use proper linting. Uh, the security plugins to clean. There are a lot of uh, VS Code extensions available, and always write your scripts and tests for the feature that you are like building. Do not use Remix ID for big projects because it's not easy to test it. And keep learning uh, as Web3 advances very fast, so you have to keep doing all this stuff. So uh, as the time is running, I, I would just quickly tell you about the platforms where you can start contributing. So one is like the superteam.earn. Uh, this is for Solana projects. You can start contributing. There are a lot of bounties listed where you can, uh, uh, on which you can work and uh, get paid as well. Then there is Build Guild. Yesterday there were a lot of workshops present on this. Uh, there is only this platform, which is for Starknet. So if you are Cairo or Rust, a person, you can contribute to this only does platform. Then there is code for Arena, which are like in, uh, interested in security and all those aspects. If you want to audit the smart contracts, you can use code for Arena for that. And uh, then there is like this learnweb3.io. So if somebody wants to start learning Web3, this is the best place to start learning. And then we have like DWorks, DAOs, and Decentralized, then Bounty Caster, which is new, where like all the bounties are listed. And if you want to know about the fellowships and open source programs that are present in the, uh, that are currently running. So these are some of the fellowships and open source programs. So you can take a pick of this. Uh, these are like Google Summer of Code, Summer of Bitcoin, MLH Web3 Fellowship, Y Academy, other protocol level fellowships. So this is like, uh, uh, you can, as a student, contribute to this. And as a developer as well, if you're a professional, you can contribute to all these open source programs. So I would just conclude by saying, do try open source contributes at least once, because it's a great way to start building if you are a student and if you are a professional as well. And you will learn a lot of things. If you don't become an open source developer for life, but it still gives you a lot of learnings. Uh, it gives you a lot of like knowledge and how to write better code, how to like work in a team, how to uh, uh, like 
uh, find the issues and solve those things. That is very important for being a good developer in the market. So uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And you can scan this if you want to connect with me. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohit. That was a wonderful talk, giving all the insights about Web3. And uh, we have a translator, as this is an international uh, conference, we have a translator to speak about it. Uh, sorry, I have a cup, so I, I have to wear a mask. Thì buổi nói chuyện vừa rồi, thì là anh diễn giả đã giới thiệu vai vai trò quan trọng của mã nguồn mở trong việc phát triển hệ sinh thái Web3 thì uh, nó tập trung vào cách đóng góp vào các dự án mã nguồn mở có thể giải quyết thách thức của Web3 đặc biệt là về sự tương tác với các nền tảng và cuối buổi thì anh có chỉ cho chúng ta một cái số cách để đóng góp cái mã nguồn mở như là Summer Code của Google hoặc là Scholab và nhiều cái môi trường lab khác nữa và chúng ta có thể tham gia bằng cách Web3 Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohit. And now I welcome our next speaker, Andrush Berlin. Hope I pronounce it perfectly. Yes. Andrush Berlin is the founder of Deep Work. Andrush Berlin is the creator of Web3 Native organizational design firm Deep Work. He has been involved in the design of over 200 different products, services, and organizations ranging from open source teams, startup, enterprise, and Fortune 500 companies. Today, Andres Berlin starts at the helm of DeepWorks as its visionary CEO, driving the company forward through innovative processes aimed at saving time and designing products for a transparent economy. His work focuses on creating an infrastructure grounded in cybernetic principles and complex system design, assisting teams in crafting, designing, and shipping next generation products while supporting creatives in leading healthier and smarter working lives. So there's a lot much to say about Andres Berlin. So I'll go with your academic profile. Andres' academic background is equally impressive with studies in computer science and psychology at Technical University Darmstadt, complemented by a focus of time-based media at University Hochschule Mainz, University of Applied Sciences. This unique combination of different disciplines underpins his holistic approach to design, technology, and human interaction, making him a multi-faced leader in the tech and design industries. Uh, now his talk is on Building sustainable infrastructure with real world impact. So I welcome you, Andrej, for the talk. So today I want to share with you an evidence based approach to dramatically increase the impact of the projects that you're working on and also basically make money with the projects that you're passionate about. Is everything okay here? Okay, cool. <clears throat> so uh, over the last six years, we've been working with a wide range of startups on their brands, products, organizations, and sometimes even physical spaces. And we follow very, very diligent market research approaches to ensure high quality deliverables and also give teams go to market strategies and recommendations on those. And we noticed three big opportunities for improvement for most teams. Oh, this doesn't work. The first one is uh, internal cohesion, which basically means staying focused by being aligned on goals and values and documenting processes. The second one is market research and user research, which basically means increasing adoption by consistently interacting with your users and stakeholders and eventually developing a business model and business and treasury management, which means allocating resources and funds in line with the goals and a shifting macroeconomic environment. So what's happening in the economy around your project. So let me first outline the current economic pressure, then I'll 
uh, go into the core issues of these three areas. And I'll give you tangible recommendations for how to increase the impact of your projects in the long run. So since 2021, uh, investors as well as founders are under pretty high pressure. Investors and VCs were able to pay back only a seventh of their uh, investment. And now their limited partners are asking for their money back. There's almost $300 billion of undeployed capital. And some VCs are trying to pay it back to their limited partners, while others are uh, focusing on their existing teams. Sorry, this does not uh, work ideally. Um, at the same time, and, oh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, I can also use the keyboard. Um, at the same time, the social media landscape is heating up again and attracting a lot of speculators, traders, and uh, less experienced contributors and developers, which increases noise. And historically, at least like in the last bull market, it made it almost impossible to raise funds if you want to stay aligned with your values. And those projects that did were at risk of getting burnout. But luckily, everybody's been building in public. And the, um, now we can learn from the wild, wild Web3 space and take these insights and actually apply them to the projects that you're building. So the, generally, the approach for most teams looks about like this. So the protocol layer is kind of the the underlying foundation, the technical foundation. Most teams start by doing their technical research, designing incentive mechanisms, and then raising funds in order to hire a team, and then build out applications, and then forcefully trying to kind of increase the user adoption in order to ostensibly satisfy their investors. Keep this diagram in mind, because most of the well-established infrastructure and projects like HTTP, SSL, <clears throat> or pretty much any product in, that you're probably using on your phone follows a quite different approach. And to make this more relatable and tangible, I'm going to use an example of a toaster. So imagine your product and, or protocol is going to be the, the technical part of it. The technical infrastructure is going to be the toaster. And then on top of it, you have different types of features. It can toast different types of bread. And obviously, the consumers are the users. So uh, over the last six years, my team of researchers and uh, consultants have juxtaposed the internal goals of teams with the feedback that they received from the users who actually use the products. And the first thing we noticed is that there was a misalignment on goals and values, lack of clarity around processes and organizational design, and very few had actually mapped out what the organization looks like, so nobody creates an org chart. So as you can see, more successful teams are actually very granular and uh, specific about their goals, while those whose future is uncertain are usually keeping their goals very vague and then reaching for global adoption or being the de facto leader in the space. In the case of a toaster, you can think about it as if you're getting together with a group of friends and the only thing you decide on is that you want the best toaster in the world and then everybody starts chipping in. And as a consequence of misalignment and this uh, vague goals, we notice the proliferation of internal conflict, blame culture, finger pointing, and that led to significant delays in development timeline. A lot of founders frequently restructured by letting go of completely skilled and capable team members after months of misaligned work. I actually have a friend who is a lawyer who told me once that it's actually quite common for managers to fabricate false evidence just to let go of team members. And that obviously leads to internal conflict that's uncomfortable and uh, in many cases also to expensive lawsuits. Secondly, almost 50% of users don't actually trust the products that they're interacting with. So this is especially relevant for the Web3 space where people interact with money. But that stems from the lack of clear user research processes. So either these teams did not follow any user research processes, or they were insufficient by asking the wrong questions or um, developing without rapid prototyping. And as a consequence, it led to a public launch that failed to get adoption, and so the entire protocol had to be rebuilt from scratch. But at that time, the 
user tested, they actually user tested too late, so they actually ran out of money to fund and uh, pay for the uh, mistakes and pay for the changes in, this, in the system. So again, like in a case of a toaster, imagine you're building this toaster, it looks super shiny or you make it super shiny, uh, it toasts many different kinds of bread, you make it make cool robot sounds, and then after two years of refining that device, you notice that the food buying marketplace stops eating bread or switches to a keto diet or something, and they actually hate the stupid robot sounds. And lastly, <clears throat> oh yeah. And lastly, <clears throat> most teams did not have any business management processes and made unintelligent allocation of their funds. So last year, we've been developing a treasury policy <clears throat> for our organization, and we're cu curious how other founders and teams would approach it. And even though many founders mentioned that they had a background in TradFi, their approach to allocating resources was rather inattentive. So this is probably the wildest quote I've ever heard. It's gonna make most sense in Web3. Um, but yeah, they keep their money in, a, there was one team that kept their money in a US bank account, which is like millions of dollars, which devalue over time. And some in crypto, which is very volatile, because funding would be just for payroll, is managed by a freelancer, and their token has 3 x and they're not sure why, and they're trying to figure it out. There's actually, um, so yeah, in the, again, like imagine building a, a device and then you actually have now a feature for frying steak and uh, it makes sick flames when you turn it on. And then after building a prototype for two years and running, burning through all of your money, you realize you can't actually pay for the electricity. There's also, uh, there's also a, um, an example of a physical co-living space in Portugal that raised millions of dollars to build a high-end concept. And uh, they started construction, designed their token like four times, invited a lot of people to physically be there and participate in the construction in exchange for their token. And when I spoke to the participants, I, um, they, everybody told me that almost the entire team was burned out, the token was worthless, and the space didn't even have water supply. So, and like, Aside from all the money and time and attention that's completely wasted, think about what that means to the reputation of the founders and the people involved in the project. So now that you know more or less um, how the, or so most of these teams spent years on building this expensive Web3 native infrastructure just to see that nobody's using the products and, and trusting them. They, burned through nearly all of their money, and in most cases it's millions of dollars, completely senselessly, with no result. So now that you more or less understand the current situation of the Web3 space, let me give you, uh, let me break down what you need to know in order to make confident decisions that lead to self-sustainability and profitability in the long term. So clear alignment on a mission statement and values are probably the most succinct piece of information that you need to know in order to capture the goal. The mission statement you can get by aligning on what it is that you're building, how your team is building it, and why it's building it. Values shine through in branding, marketing material, and communication style, and they connect the audience with your project over the long term, and they make it them interested in being involved with your project over the long term. In addition to mission and values, a clear documentation of processes and an org chart makes transparent to everybody what work is being done and how it actually relates to the mission. So people, feel, so people who work on the project feel connected to the mission, regardless of their position. And you can get that by mapping out all the tasks first, then grouping them and categorizing them into the teams, and then assigning the tasks to the people who enjoy working on it the most. So getting buy-in from the team on the accuracy of this chart, and of course there's also different management structures and who is responsible for what, but getting buy-in from everybody on the accuracy of the chart excites them to work together in the long term. And also creates a foundation for conflict resolution. Just remember that people wear different hats and have different roles that shift throughout time. 
So it's very important to keep that uh, organizational chart and the processes updated regularly. With regard to user research, there's actually just three questions that you need to answer and keep track of. Who are your users and stakeholders? What, how do they describe their problem? And how do they describe your solution to their problem? The users and stakeholders are initially assumptions, and the users are, in most cases, people that the team can approach directly. And the solution is something that your team can prototype and then present to your users and stakeholders for feedback. <clears throat> if you gather feedback, please try not to ask people what they need or what they want, but rather try to stick to <clears throat> approximately these guidelines. So ask questions about their past experience. So what do they remember? What, was, what worked for them in their experience or what hasn't? Um, make questions open-ended, so don't ask yes-no questions because they awkwardly end the conversation. Don't give away any clues because you want to understand what happens in the minds of your potential users. And you can start broad just by outlining everything and then going more specific about what you really want to know about their experience. And obviously, avoid confirmation bias. So, so try not to make people excited about your thing. Don't talk about your project, but rather uh, understand their reality. And so increasing the level of detail about these questions will give you a very high granularity around the problem space that you're facing and also show you probably unlimited opportunities for your solution design. And so the gaining clarity over these three areas relies on constant interaction with the users and stakeholders and understanding how they articulate their experience. And then these insights you can take and use in order to strategize around which features to, um, to, allocate, uh, to allocate your resources next to and uh, prototype and develop. And so if you can articulate that back to your audience, then that's how you increase uh, interest and drive adoption to your project. With regard to the treasury management, um, I just recommend starting with a treasury policy. So if you have a ba bank accounts or wallets, just map out what wallets there are, uh, who controls which wallets, how are they being used, and how do you juxtapose that to the economic environment? Because everything changes in your environment, and if you have a certain runway or a certain amount of money, then you can intelligently allocate those towards specific resources that generate interest and actually extends your runway significantly. The business model is going to develop um, by paying attention to these two areas. So your internal cohesion in, in, in terms of mission and goals and values and how that relates to your market research and understanding of your users. And then optimizing for the highest value density. So what is the highest value offering or service that you can provide to the highest paying customers? And so constant feedback will show you how people value it. So if they stop valuing your project, you can still readjust your strategy and also how close your team is in achieving its mission. And usually every single conversation that you have with people will give you very high quality information around a meaningful trajectory of your development. So in case of a, a toaster, again, like if you frequently interact with, with the users, you will notice that people stop buying bread uh, early enough and you can build in features for frying steak instead. And so only once you have a business model established, you um, can start mapping out the value flows, quantifying those in terms of real money uh, or numbers, and then start adjusting incentive mechanisms. And once your payments have to cross geographical borders and your internal database is um, insufficient for the scale and, and adoption that you need to facilitate, only then it makes sense to introduce blockchain and token um, technologies to actually facilitate the necessary growth. So aligning your team on a mission and goals and values, keeping track of your users and getting feedback from them, as well as paying attention to how you allocate your resources, you can do that at any stage. So you don't even need a product or any funding at that stage. But it will always show you the opportunity for creating high impact and then developing a business model at a, as a consequence. So developing this kind of infrastructure or, or projects 
comes as a consequence of frequently interacting with users on the top and creating value locally first and then keeping the quality of their experience high or increasing it while slowly automating out your uh, team's effort, reducing your team's cost, and then breaking it down to a minimal cost for maintenance, which is then what the protocol kind of runs on. So if you can keep track of these three areas, so aligning your team on a mission and being clear about the organizational structure, doing market and user research to understand all your stakeholders and users, and keeping track of your treasury and resource allocation, um, then you basically have everything you need to know in order to develop long-term sustainable products that become profitable over time. So that's it. I wish you a wonderful day. And if you have any questions, I'll be around here probably. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, you can do it. Now again, we have a translator who will be doing continuous. Yes. À, chào các bạn. Thì trong buổi giới thiệu vừa rồi, thì ông Berlin này là founder của DeepWork. Thì uh, qua quá trình nghiên cứu và phát triển thị trường, thì uh, ông ý đã chia sẻ một số kinh nghiệm và hướng dẫn cái framework để phát triển Web 3 và để kiểu xác định cái sự uh, bền vững kiểu nếu mà chúng ta muốn phát triển trên môi trường web ạ. Thank you very much. Now we'll call upon the next speaker. À, về uh, kiểu là muốn dịch tiếng Việt đấy các bạn. Thì các bạn scan cái mã QR trên tường để dịch từ tiếng Anh sang tiếng Việt nhá, để mình không bị miss thông tin ấy. Ok, cảm ơn các bạn. So, oh. Is the next speaker here, Vincent Lau? Yes, yeah, right, hi. Yes. While connecting the laptop, I'll just go through the brief bio data of Vincent Lau. So Vincent is a tech lead at uh, LiquidX Studio, Web3 Devs, community organizer. Chun In Vincent Lau is a seasonal tech lead and a Web3 architect hailing from Singapore, recognized for his expertise in bridging the gap between strategy and execution within the startup ecosystem. Fluent in multiple languages, Vincent's career is marked by significant contributions to the development of technology, teams, companies, and visions. He currently offers his services as a tech lead at PDA Lab, leveraging his rich background with notable entities such as Enimoka Brands, Nine Gag, Yahoo, and various startup leadership roles. Vincent's professional journey is distinguished by his adeptness in technical architecture design, Web3 solution architecture, and acting as an interim CTO for engineering team coaching and hiring. His portfolio showcases a profound ability to manage vendor relations and partnerships alongside evaluating product roadmaps from an engineering standpoint. His commitment to testing automation, recruitment, and cloud cost optimization further illustrates his comprehensive skill set. A pivotal figure in the tech community, Vincent has led development initiatives resulting in significant achievements such as Mochaverse NFT project, which boosted $5.5 million in sales within its first 24 hours and achieved a market cap exceeding $200 million. His advisory role across 300 plus subsidiaries and joint ventures have been instrumental in enhancing software architecture smart contract security and tech delivery best expertise. An active dev community organizer and lead of Facebook DevC Hong Kong, Vincent has orchestrated over 30 developer communities, events across Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. His open invitation for coffee reflects his enthusiasm for startup, tech, and language exchange, marketing him as a pivotal connector and innovator in tech landscape. I welcome you, Vincent, for the talk. 
yes you can continue thank you all of you thank you hey chào các bạn uh, hi everyone uh, i'm vincent and um, today i'm going to talk about translations about languages yeah so it's uh, like human languages so if you look for like words python javascript and you're in the one room yeah we are talking about uh, how webfi can help crowdsourcing translation for open source yeah có bao nhiêu bạn nói tiếng việt yeah if you don't understand then <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't you don't so yeah um so most of them and uh, most of you uh, uh i think you you speak vietnamese yeah that's great yeah so just want to share a little bit of my own uh journey yeah because i think that gives some context to the talk yeah thanks for the introduction just now and i would like to highlight uh my first job in a startup is actually in a localization company yeah so i helped at, uh different clients like airbnb uh Uh, to translate into different languages and then eventually i started my own company uh, a language technology company where i also uh, help uh, mozilla to do some uh, technical content translations and work on some education uh, technology products like language learning products yeah so um, after that like in recent years i started my career in webfi and i learned a lot about the uh, new concepts the opportunities And it's like I I finally realized there are some new opportunities unlocked in the uh, localization industry by Webfi, and that's why today I'm here to share my ideas. Yeah. So yeah, myself just want to add like uh, I like learning languages, uh, Korean, Japanese, uh, hopefully a little bit uh, Vietnamese. Yeah. So um, that's that's why um, I really want to devote my time on uh, localizing different open source. Yeah. So I think uh, like. Today, uh, our talk started with a question, and here is a university. University is the place for questions. So instead of like just I sharing everything, like I was, I would say like, why don't we like uh, uh, waste the question? Let's let us like think together. And I would say um, uh, I would break break that down into three questions. The first one is, why should we care about localization at all? And then. Uh, I mean, like, no talk is uh, compared with the talk about AI this year. So, like, is AI going to help us to solve everything in localization? And then, okay, finally, what we mentioned is uh, what can we learn from WebD? Okay, the first one. So, I think um, I, I'm really grateful that the Ethereum team uh, did a sharing yesterday. So, they shared their experience localizing their own website. And I think the goal is super simple. If if we expect the next billions of users of uh, Ethereum or any Webfi ecosystem, they they are coming from everywhere in the world. So cryptocurrency has no barrier. Technology itself has no barrier. But then many of the time uh, we have like a the language barrier in between. No matter the community or the education content. Uh, I'm not sure about you guys, but like many communities, I know they have they find it quite hard uh, to understand uh, uh, what is going on because most of the materials are in English. And I myself, I I, I spend a ton of time learning English, so yeah, I I always like spend more time struggle in the language rather than like actually picking up stuff when I was younger. So uh, I would say it's a ping pong for myself. And from the Ethereum.org, yeah, uh, we actually see that uh, according to the data, once they started the translation program, they actually see a like a rise in the uh, page views. So because as what we said, right, most of the audience doesn't uh, doesn't like uh, use English as much. So once they have their own language version, they actually are much more engaged to learn about uh, Ethereum. Yeah. So I think it's a really positive. Uh, Uh, example and show the importance of uh, localization. And okay, if localization is important, why isn't everyone translating as much as possible then, right? Yeah, I mean, why sometimes you might come across like uh, videos online, they're only in English. Why isn't everyone doing that? So um, just to share my experience working in the localization industry, yeah, let's simplify that a lot. So imagine you have a website similar to ethereum.org, you want to translate it. So you are the website developers. So the first thing you have to do is to like uh, uh, extract those strings or like source in in those like uh, original language in English, 
and then to supply that to the manager. Right? Manager here, we mean a project manager or like localization manager. And then eventually they pass on to the translator, but then you need a mechanism to guarantee the quality. And at the end of the day, like if you are the developer, you don't speak Japanese, and then someone say, okay, I've tran translated uh, Japanese for you. You just trust me, right? Yeah, that's, that must be good. But that doesn't usually uh, uh, work, so you need a reviewer to further review uh, the work by translator to make sure everything is correct, just like a quality assurance in the software development. So this is a highly simplified flow, but we all know like when we develop a software, software changes like super fast. So at the end of the day, your software, um, uh, I mean like we will need like Git or other version control system to manage, right? You develop, you launch, you fix bugs, you deploy, and then you iterate again and again, right? And for obvious reason, whenever you iterate your software, most of the time, the language, uh, the strings also change, right? The copywriting changes. Yeah, you have a new uh, page or you have uh, uh, changed that uh, to be shorter or longer, or whatever. Yeah, so the, like the ideal like workflow for localization to work generally is you have to pair up with your software development workflow. So not just the CI CD for deferment, but also the CI CD for the translations. Yeah. So let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah. So let's just talk about okay, I have a website and I want to kickstart the process of uh, localization. All right. So let's go for the most uh, standard uh, API. Yeah. So it is from the Mozilla. So if you're only doing for English, then okay, what you have to do when you are building a website, you just have to write 10, okay, we, uh, we are done. But then, okay, if you consider uh, at least, like for English, you want to differentiate the message and messages, because we all know like uh, English, you want to be pro to add an S at the end, right, most of the time. So they provide a library for you to write that. Yeah, so it's like something like format the pro, and then you, you can do it. and. At the end of the day, you will need to supply some of the translation in this format. So that makes sense, right? Okay, um, if you have one, then uh, you just use item in here and then no, then items, oh, sorry, more than items. And then if there's no item, then no item. So you have at least three version just for English to handle this kind of cases. So you see some complexity here, right? I mean, just by uh, uh, starting the first step of localization. And then, okay, what about German then? Okay. Um, I'm not sure anyone speaks German here, but I study in Germany, so I can say German, uh, they have like a three genders. You have the uh, male, female, and then the neutral gender. And then more than that, like you have to think about the grammar cases. So by just like thinking about how you say the or like a, then you have to think about all this case. I spent like six months of my life memorizing all this. And then if you try to put that back to what we have, I can, I can say it's way more complicated than this. And if German isn't enough, let's look at Russian, yeah. So in Russian, just by talking about plural form, I think you will need to consider like both tables and like 12 cases, but I don't speak Russian, so I don't comment on that. I can only tell you it's complicated. So uh, the root cause of why it is hard is because uh, we mentioned there are a lot of like complexity of software development we are keep iterating uh, the software and we need to make sure uh, we can launch the things uh, safely, fastly. And then at the same time, you have to uh, think about the complexity of human languages as well, right? When you try to mix them together, localization become a really complex problem. That's my take. And I can tell you there's a lot, a lot more complexity. For example, like uh, uh, what, like, what I said, like, do you need the review on your reviewers? Because if you don't speak Japanese, right, no matter how much tran translator agency you hire, you can only trust their, like, uh, maybe their resume or their reputation, but you can actually never check against their work, right? And if you are talking about website, besides the, like, the test, are you uh, uh, required to also translate the images or the videos? And then, okay, if we are talking about translating to Spanish, are we translating to Spanish Mexico or are we translating to the Spain uh, that Spanish? Yeah. And if you're doing like a, a translation of video, then how you provide that video as a whole when, they are, when the translator is trying to translate to make that UX uh, as smooth as possible. There are many, many problems like that. 
so all in all, like localization is a complicated process. And I would say like there are quite some commercial platforms. I don't want to name them, but like they sometimes provide uh, support uh, for open source projects. Uh, like Ethereum Dog, they are also using one. But then that is not a permissionless uh, thing. So you have to talk to them and then say, hey, can you uh, share your platform for us for free use because uh, we are doing like an open source project, something like that, right? And we are grateful that someone actually started some open source project just on that. So it's like um, a web late, uh, which is a Git, uh, con a Git version control that translation system. And I think a little bit recently, Mozilla also built their own, which is called a Pontoon. Yeah, you, you can check this out if you just want to like uh, have a proper workflow or um, platform to manage your translations. But we were saying like uh, this is not uh, sufficient because um, um, you need to think about uh, who is going to like sponsor this kind of translation, right? For example, if today you have a website, then uh, you, you don't certainly go for like one language to 70 languages because for every translation, you, you have to pay. So many of the time, uh, people go for crowdsourcing translation because it become a, like a win-win situation, right? So just like, again, you feed them dog. So when they uh, try to ask you to contribute to the Vietnamese uh, version of the website, it's not only about that translation. Uh, we also hope that like during the process, like you will have the chance to like read the materials, you will have the chance to share your work with others. So it's like not just contribution, engagement yeah so by crowdsourcing your translation you're able to have uh, like you, you can grow a like more international diverse community to contribute and to work and to use your open source software and it sounds great right it's kind of like free and then like uh, 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 it's, it's so good in engagement but again like why why people not do that too often yeah what is the challenge over there and there are, again, many challenges, and the first one is like, if you are doing a crowdsourcing translation, then you don't have a guarantee on when can you deliver, right? By kind of the definition, a little bit similar to open source, typically. And also, I would say, um, if you look at some of the trans a crowdsourcing translation platform by the big techs, like Twitter and YouTube, they started with those crowdsourcing translation. Uh, maybe if you are like a, a use that like six years, six years ago in, on YouTube, you can actually submit your own translation onto any video and it will be available. But eventually they all shut it down. And why? It's because like there are many people trying to use, use that as a tool to scam and abuse. Maybe they will put their own advertisement into that video. Or maybe they, they just want to like uh, um, uh, pair around and then they just put some uh, gibberish, some, some like uh, rubbish content onto it and then to get some reward or whatever. So crowdsourcing is not that reliable in a sense, although it do gives you uh, a lot of like uh, engagement. It's a, a little bit like, okay, 80% of the people are good, but then 20% of the people are bad. And then, okay, uh, the system itself uh, didn't, didn't work too well. Okay, so let's stop there for a moment. Yeah, I will come back to this, but then uh, what I explain is a lot of capacity of localization and crowdsourcing uh, sometimes didn't work well, okay? And we are going to the second question. Okay, we have to talk about AI. So we all see like, uh, like open AI chatbot, et cetera. They are so good at translation, right? Because basically you put any question into uh, most of the languages, they can give you a proper answer and then you, they can do the translation work for you. Then how is that going to be um, put into place today? So I would say like machine translation it's actually nothing new because uh, the first machine translation conference is actually in 1956 in London. So it's around like the time like uh, we have computers, then we talk about machine translation. We think about this vision of like uh, the machine doing the work for us and language didn't change too much as well, right? And from what we see, like the innovation at AI and LLM is correct that they do have a, a lot of use case in NLP and uh, translation or transcription tasks. And if you look at the Y Combinator startups in Silicon Valley, um, last winter, someone is doing the lip sync. So how you like submit a video maybe in uh, English, and then you can see those actors, they, their lips, their mouth, they change to be speaking with this. 
So it's not just about translation, but also about the video generation and modification. Yeah, so this is kind of the state of the art. So I will quote this, like um, future is already arrived, just not even distributed because this AI technology is actually so powerful. But if we go back to the, uh, like any open source project today, or we go back to the uh, current in the industry, like the, those platforms, they're actually sticking with what they have 10 years ago or even like 15 years ago. They are having a, like a quite complicated workflow without getting the benefit from all this AI. So let's, let's look at one example, which is the uh, Whisper model from OpenAI. I think it's from uh, two years ago. So it got a lot of like trained data on the uh, voice, on the, uh, yeah, uh, uh, mostly English and some translation. And what it does is it, it will do like the uh, speech recognition. So you give, give it a voice script and then it will output a transcript basically. So this is the state of the art, but if you um, look at that, then you will see even just for the transcription, it's far from perfect, especially if, if we forget about English or Spanish, et cetera. If we go for, uh, for, for example, like Vietnamese here, then uh, like, I think like a 100, out of 100 words, then maybe X words or nine words are just incorrect. And this before translation. So this like about transcription. So how many years we have to wait before we actually have an AI model that is so proficient that we can uh, ignore human in the workflow? I think we are still a little bit far from there. And, but, but the good news is, yeah, uh, it recognized the usage of that like supervised data set. So the point I'm trying to make here is we have AI, but AI alone is not sufficient. We need also human in the loop. And if you are aware of the news like last month, then we also know like, okay, uh, Google, uh, Gemini, they have a lot of buyers. So my question will be, um, could we just trust the AI from the backpack? And who should decide the best translation? I would say it should be the community. It should be the human, not AI, not backpack. And again, human has to be in the loop. And okay, so AI is about data and computation. Can we own our own LLM? Partly, yes. We already have that uh, hugging face and like Michelle AI um, open source model. But then it's not sufficient because um, we do have concern on the data. For example, if you're trying to translate for Laos, you will see in the NLP community, the data sets that are available for you to change your models is actually less than 1% compared to English. Yeah, so it depending which country you are from, which language you are speaking, but then it's actually uh, uh, very hard to develop AI model for production use on your own, yeah. All right, then uh, let me jump my head, time is running out. So what we can learn from Worthy. So let me get back to the AI pawn. Yeah, so I believe like uh, what I just mentioned is mostly like centralized AI from big text, but actually in Worthy, they're already like decentralized computing and storage. And Falcon is a very good example. Then uh, my personal favorite, you can use Bacala, this framework to run decentralized AI models on decentralized nodes. And also, um, I really believe in the thesis like AI belongs on chain. So if one day AI can buy, AI can pay, AI can like trade, AI can vote, AI is autonomous, then how you govern them, how you control them. And the only way I can think of is put their parameters onto the blockchain onto a smart contract such that we can govern them. And there are a lot of things going on, like how you participate voting in a DAO or like how you uh, incentivize people. And then we have different ways of uh, funding open source project. Thanks to the uh, previous speaker then, uh, we all know like uh, there's a lot of like incentives, airdrop, uh, whenever you contribute in the open source. And <clears throat> I will say, like I will highlight this one. So. There's a term called that we show active funding. It's actually, okay, once you have your job done, you have your project, then uh, it is easier for people to agree on like what is useful and, and to acknowledge who built it. Okay, you have already done this work and why don't we, the community, we, right now we uh, uh, support you, we give you uh, uh, the incentive, we uh, airdrop your money, for example. Yeah, so it's a trend in the web fee, which, uh, I want to kind of like uh, 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 answer my own question on how WebV can ha help localization. Because we mentioned about crowdsourcing, we mentioned about AI, 
And actually, with this kind of like web fee technologies, you can have the incentives. You can organize these incentives. Okay, for example, the room here. Right now, we can go buy a Vietnamese AI model and run it on the decentralized cow. We just have to cow fund it, and we just have to decide. Okay, what to translate? And that's what I'm building. Yeah, that's my idea, and that's the problem I'm trying to solve. So I'm working on this project, this open source project uh, called the Ethereum Localization Service, which does uh, just that. And we are working with the Ethereum Attestation Service in the Fellowship team. Yeah. So the too long uh, don't wait is like the short version is if you are running any open source project, then work with us, and then we will set up the AI for you. We will set up the cow source translation workflow for you to help you to reward uh, the contributors. And I will say at the end of the day. Um, uh, how you determine the translation uh, is, is actually a very uh, social problem. For example, who can attest me speak uh, Vietnamese or not, right? Like then the easiest uh, way is you just talk to me in Vietnamese. So it's actually a very social thing, whether uh, you are able to like, uh, uh, have that language proficiency. And for us to attest whether a translation is good or not, we, have, we can build this social graph, and then we can uh, uh, have the crowd have the like people to decide. Okay, this translation is better. This translation is like less good. And then we put the incentives. We reward people accordingly. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea. And then we are already building this like a um, uh, product prototype that you can vote, vote up or vote down just like Stack Overflow. Uh, when we have this like a uh, translated uh, subtitles being online. So finally, yeah, just to wrap up. Yeah, because time is running out. So we are also calling for contributions. If you are keen on becoming a technical video translator, I truly appreciate you can join us. We have uh, like set like 100 videos to translate, and we are, we are planning to like uh, distribute like 1,000 of USD dollars to any contributors. And as I said, right, we want to set up these incentives, and then we uh, would like to give that to the uh, international community, such that we can co-own our own language, we can build our own AI pipeline, and then we can bring uh, ecosystem like Ethereum to the global audience. So uh, please follow us on Twitter and then uh, also join our Telegram. And that's kind of uh, my talk. So thank you and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Vincent, for the talk. And uh, yes, uh, now I call the translator to translate into Vietnamese, yes. Thank you. À, thì ngài Vincent vừa rồi đã giới thiệu cách mà Web3 có thể hỗ trợ việc dịch cho phần dùng uh, open source thông qua crowdsourcing. Thì ông đấy đã sử dụng công nghệ crypto để kích thích cái uh, mạng để xây dựng một cái mạng lưới toàn cầu để kích thích cho việc đóng góp và dịch thuật ạ. Em cảm ơn. Yeah, thank you very much Vincent. So Manish is here. Yeah. By the time Manish connects the laptop, I'll just go through about uh, Manish. Manish Kumar Barnal is a community lead of CapEx developer and community builder and has hosted many technical workshops, sessions, conferences, and hackathons. From participating all, mentoring and organizing, he has hands-on experience too. Also, Manish is a quick active in open source community. He's a GitHub campus expert and LFX mentee. Now I welcome you, Manish, for the presentation. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a great time here. And like today we are having a topic on decentralized storage devolution from IPFS to Filecoin. Uh, I guess like most of you have already attended yesterday's build station, so you have a basic idea about blockchain. Uh, can you raise a hand like how many of all already know about blockchain and uh, Web3 or anything related to that? Have basic idea about it? Can you have a raise hand? Okay, a few. Awesome. All right, let me quickly get started. Myself, Manish Kumar Barnal. I am coming right from India and and I was really excited about this conference and this talk as well. Let's start. All right. So this is our today's agenda. Uh, we'll co uh, cover introduction to content address, IPFS, uh, about Filecoin, and then IPFS with Filecoin. And then we'll also share some resources where you can refer uh, later on and learn from it. Next, uh, here is an introduction about content addressing. 
what is content addressing in in the general web uh, web uh, like web 2 what happened like we uh, we have to put a location address to get, like basically it works on ip addresses right where we can go, get the geographical location right but in case of web 3 we are we don't have to do that like we don't need geolocation for it so we are uh, we, so basically it's distributed system so how it does like uh, basically it's a web 2 uh, where you can find like uh, if there is a domain url you can find the beagle.jpg uh, suppose uh, it's a dog image right it's supposed to be a dog image but uh, anyone can tamper it very easily if uh, you just go to the domain and you will find a cat image right it is possible right it's completely possible but uh, like so uh, basically in case of web3 what happened like uh, we basically uh, believe like in content addressing we put images which have unique hash which cannot be tampered if you try to tamper uh, it will give you another unique address i will show you how it actually works so basically in uh, decentralized system uh, we uh, actually follows uh, is library isbn number how it works like instead of going to the exact location we follow a like algorithmic hash code let me show you an example so it is a self describing hash code how it works so it it works with the algorithm you are using the length and the values so it will give you a cryptographic hash okay so if you uh, suppose uh, i am giving you an example suppose if there is an image of a dog okay and you have uploaded it to a ipfs it will give you an uh, code like this okay a hash code like this if someone try to uh, like tamper it or try to crop it or make some changes on it it will generate another unique id or unique content address so basically it will help uh, like uh, if in sensitive cases like suppose if there is an uh, sensitive proof or a like media file for maybe news agencies so if someone try to temper it they can't if they are trying to temper the whole ad address will be changed so once it changed like you will get to know that is tampered and if you are using the same content address you will get the original image or the original proof whatever you have uploaded so that's the idea so if you have any uh, content address you can like simply go to cid inspector and check the what exactly the content ad uh, address is holding like basically you can uh, recover the metadata next is ipfs so ipfs uh, like in the today's era like uh, we see like data is everything and like most of us like have our data uh, hosted on like big giants like microsoft google and uh, companies like that but in decentralized world like uh, things are quite distributed and it needs to be distributed because here users uh, like power all the data okay if users are holding it like then it's like more secured in a uh, more secured because it's distributed system no one knows like where it is uh, storing and if it's centralized like uh, we mostly see like whenever uh, something happened wrong and it's like went down like it's whole server went down right so for that like we have come up with ipfs what is ipfs uh, first is like ipfs stands for uh, interplanetary file system file system is very simple uh, similar to uh, like folders and files we actually have in our drive or in our local system but here interplanetary stands like basically meant for like even if you are in mars you have you can access your files okay from earth suppose if there is a file you want to fetch from earth to mars and uh, like it will take around an hour to you but uh, there is an uh, like there is a thing like if it's a distributed system anyone in mars already fetch that file and you can easily access it in within seconds okay so that is the idea and yeah so this is how our actual files look like uh, if we uh, have any file on our local system it will visible like this right path dot uh, index.html whatever it is right you have to know the location of it right where it's stored and it's similarly on web2 you have to know the domain like domain actually shows the ip address so you have to know the path but in case of ipfs you don't have to know the actual location of the pro, uh, where it hosted instead of that you can uh, simply get a content address which will tell you like which will give you the exact uh, like image or exact media file but it won't disclose your main location or like actual geographical location because it's a, a distributed in nature so no one can fetch your exact location but that's pretty much about uh, ipfs and yeah so using ipfs is and like task basically uh, there are two ways okay either you can host your own ipfs but again it's centralized or either you can give it to someone why uh, why uh, someone will host your media files or your videos either it should be uh, very popular 
either maybe uh, Elon Musk having some uh, data for you or you like that's what you are hosting, then you can do it or someone will do it, else you won't do it, right? So uh, here would uh, be a few things like either you can run your own node, but again, it could be a centralized system or you can have someone to run your node and pay to them. But again, it's a centralized system, right? You are paying someone to host it. But there are companies like uh, Pinata service, uh, like Pinata, Temporal, Infura. They are like giving pinning services where they have distributed network where you can give them uh, your data and they will host you for host it for you. But here is a twist that again, uh, there will be a, uh, there is no reality uh, like real reliability on it. How you will will you verify that the data is not getting tampered or data is not, uh, data is safe for you, right? So now we have uh, to solving this problem. We have. Uh, decentralized system, uh, which is Filecoin, like it will help us to fetch our sensitive data, which it will help us to pre protect our sensitive data to get on, uh, like get public or something. So yeah, this is how Filecoin storage designed. So it's compatible with IPFS, of course, and then it's in Web3, so you can, uh, like, it would be decentralized, and then you have a concept called verifiable uh, with via cryptographic proofs. We will see, like, uh, in the uh, later slides. Also, uh, they have a very massive decentralized network. As of now, I guess 180 million uh, TB data is already stored there, and which is 1% of cloud storage, which we are having right now. And yeah, so this is an uh, anatomy or like architecture of Filecoin, how actually it works. So basically, you can consider yourself as a client, a uh, client uh, who, uh, who are hosting their uh, basically metadata or the or the data basically stored in a smart contract or via app, then you are uh, doing a uh, like storage deal where you are uh, uh, coordinating with the storage provider, and they will uh, once you are uh, made a storage deal, you have get you will get a proof of replication. What it does, it will show you they have it will uh, on chain proof which will prove that you will get and uh, your data is uh, replicated on the uh, on the storage provider's uh, server. And then again, over time, like you, you may be done a storage deal of six months, one year or two years, they will buy time. Like suppose in every three months or every six months, they will give you and proof that your data is uh, already there. So it, it makes things reliable that your data is uh, like protected by them. And if someone's trying to like any storage provider trying to uh, like tamper it or do something about it. So there is a concept called staking, like uh, every storage provider have to stake some, uh, some file tokens. If they are trying to do any wrong stuff, they will get slashed from there. Okay. And next is uh, towards the end, like either uh, like end of the storage deal, either you can retrieve your data or you can extend your deal by paying more. Right. So this is the whole idea. So there are uh, two things like uh, proof of replication and proof of space time, which gives you the satisfaction that your data is say, uh, safe. And yeah, that's pretty much. All right. So IPFS is, and Filecoin is the best complement where IPFS is fast and uh, like flexible for retrieval. It made things uh, distributed. And the next is like Filecoin, uh, like which make things uh, reliable for you and makes sure that you have all the proofs that your sensitive data is on the right hands. Awesome. So these are the some tools of Filecoin, uh, sorry, Web3, where you can uh, actually build on, like you must have heard Ethe about Ethereum yesterday. And, and then you have a simple layer tools and then development environment. And for storage, you can use either IPFS and Filecoin. And yeah, that's pretty much. There are other plenty of tools which we are using for uh, development. Next is uh, like Web3 all the way down. So basically, if you are a uh, like hackathon project or someone which is just started, there are uh, simple tools which is uh, hosted on Filecoin. If you have very less now, uh, less storage, or like suppose if you want to host one GB file, you don't have to go to Filecoin or IPFS because it will be a long process. So either you can choose for uh, tools like this, uh, Web3 dot storage, NFT storage, or Lighthouse. Uh, these are some tools which is very easy to access or very very easy to use. If you can simply uh, go and upload your file as you do in on like normal uh, like normal uh, Vercel or somewhere if you are a web two dev, and that's pretty much about it. And there here are some resources you can take a pic of it or something like that so that you can refer it later on. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask me now. All right. I'm, am I on time? Awesome. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the Discord link if you want to join Discord and Slack. Sla Filecoin is active on Slack mostly. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you, Manish Kumar, for the talk. And now it's time for translation into Vietnamese. À, thì chào các bạn về uh, buổi chia sẻ vừa rồi của ngài Manish thì, uh, thì anh đấy đã chia sẻ về hai khái niệm thứ nhất là IPFS và thứ hai là Filecoin thì giao thức IPFS là một giao thức mạng ngang hàng dùng để truy cập và lưu dữ liệu trên internet khác với các các cái uh, giao thức uh, lưu trữ tập trung ấy ạ còn Filecoin chỉ là một dự án tập trung vào việc xây dựng một mạng lưới lưu trữ phi tập trung có nghĩa là mọi người sẽ đóng góp cái uh, mã nguồn mở của mình vào đấy và có thể uh, kiếm tiền đóng góp vào đấy ạ. Cảm ơn. Thank you again. Thank you Manish Kumar, speakers and everyone. It's time for tea and coffee break and we'll come back by 11. Okay. So and the tea and coffee is sponsored by Penpot. Okay. Thank you very much all of you. So we'll be back by 11. Thank you. Ờ uh, thì chào các bạn thì uh... Buổi sáng hôm nay thì mình sẽ tạm dừng ở đây và giờ sẽ có phần tea break và các bạn có thể ra ngoài để dùng tea break và hãy quay lại trước 11 giờ để nghe các phiên tiếp theo. Cảm ơn các bạn. Welcome back all of you. So now we have a talk on empowering web3 innovations bridging communities with devfolio by the speaker Denver de Souza who is the CEO of devfolio Denver de Souza is a dynamic and visionary leader in the tech industry currently serving as chief executive officer at devfolio since January 2022 with a robust experience spanning over 6 years in various roles within the company Denver has demonstrated a profound ability to lead, innovate, and inspire. Prior to his current role, he had made significant contributions as chief of staff for seven months, where he was instrumental in steering strategic in initiatives and operational excellence. His tenure at Devfolio is marked by dedication, dedication to fostering a vibrant community of tech enthusiasts and developers through world-class hackathons. So Denver holds certifications in supply chain fundamentals and supply chain analytics from edX, underscoring his commitment to continuous learning and professional development. His multifaceted career is a testament to his continuous leadership in tech community, his innovative mindset and unwavering commitment to making a positive impact in technology landscape. So I welcome you to the talk. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Guru. All right. Um, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for your patience. Um, I was unfortunately running late, and um, you know, thanks for waiting up for me. I hope uh, what you get of this talk is worth it. All right. Um, so, first up, like I think in true Web3 tradition, we usually start by saying GM, and GM is just, it's nothing but good morning. Um, and it's just why and why, because it's nice to say good morning to, uh, you know, your friends, right? Um, and um, yeah, so for this talk, uh, I would like to keep it a bit um, informal, um, because there's not much point if it's just a one-way conversation. Um, so I'm going to be covering some ground, uh, talking about web, our work in Web3 and how we are thinking about, uh, you know, helping developers put their reputation on chain. Uh, what I would like is that at the end, if we have some time, I'm going to leave some time for questions. I'm going to run through the material a bit fast. Um, but then if we have time for questions, um, I would like to give the three best questions, um, some swag from Defolio. So I have this t-shirt with me, um, and I have this diary with me, um, and I can offer it to uh, three people who ask me um, good questions, right? All right. Um, everyone good for that? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> At the end. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, uh, we've been, in fact, I've been in the hackathon space since around, uh, we've been doing hackathons since 2015, uh, back but when we were in university just like this. Um, and then I think we formally started hosting, we built this platform called Devfolio in um, 2018 because we were like, um, there are already so many hackathons that we are running and um, we did not think the other hackathon platforms were good enough for us. So we just built our own platform and, and then we grew. All right, I'm gonna talk about it a bit. Um, yeah. All right. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is Devfolio. Now Devfolio's tagline is redefining economic opportunities for builders. I'm going to get to each one of this, um, each one of these words, what this means, and hopefully it's clear by the end of this uh, presentation, right? We are now 600K builders strong. Uh, we have uh, 50,000 projects built, and we have dispersed 4.5 million USD in bounties. Um, so this is through hackathons, fellowships, and grant programs, right? All right. Uh, what else? Okay, uh, we have been while we have worked across uh, you know industries, including fintech, AI, and much more. We have done a fair amount of work in Web three. Um, and why is that? Uh, I think back when we started in 2018, I don't think anybody was doing much uh, in the space. So we see ourselves as the middlemen to help inspire the next generation in the forefront technologies, right? And help you get in early. So that's why we started with this one hackathon in 2018 called ETH India. Um, now that one ETH India, it was not a very big hackathon. It was like, I think 150 people or so. Um, but yeah, like that led to a lot of things, a lot of the early Web3 Indian projects uh, were formed, were built at that hackathon. Many people hired team members, and that really grew over the years to the point where, so we did ETH India 2018, 2019. In 2020 onwards, we started doing online ETH India uh, just because of COVID. Uh, continued that right up till 22, when we did uh, another, um, yeah, physical in-person in edition of the ETH India Hackathon. Um, and that hackathon was the biggest Ethereum hackathon in the world. Uh, by biggest, what do I mean? Uh, we, so we had 2,000, um, if, I'm, if I want to be exact, I think we had 1,700 um, hackers and like 300 or so other folks at the hackathon over three days in Bangalore. And we had 460 projects submitted. Um, so by number of projects submitted, we were the biggest hackathon um, in the world, um, in the Ethereum space. And uh, yeah, we were the biggest hackathon um, until last year when we again became the biggest hackathon um, and we had 480 projects submitted. So that's the overall metric we go by. Um, unlike other events, uh, ETH India has a hackathon first um, and everything else later and the whole you know, uh, blockchain week pops up around it. All right, um, so what's the impact of uh, ETH India been? Um, so uh, yeah, like uh, projects, this was a project built at ETH in, uh, 2018 ETH, in ETH India uh, called Instatap. Um, and Instatap is now a protocol um, that is, that has uh, total value locked in its tokens, um, I think right now it's sitting at around 5 billion uh, USD. Um, so that's sort of the market cap of that project. Uh, now it would be unfair for us to take all the credit here, but um, we are glad that we were able to at least provide a platform for them to uh, come and build this. Uh, we, all right. There were also many other builders that I'll talk about. Um, all right, so how do we support hackathons, other hackathons? So we built a platform for ourselves first, and then we went around and provided to other hackathons, uh, ETH Denver last year, uh, this year, ETH Barcelona, ETH KL. Uh, we have done uh, one called Biddle, Viet Biddle Vietnam, ETH Seoul, 
um, ETH Munich, and many more. So all other hackathons, uh, Ethereum hackathons around the world, also use Defolio as a platform for managing their hackathon applications and judging and more. All right. Uh, what else do we do? We also do this thing called fellowships, where um, it's a mentor-led program. And in eight weeks, we pair you with industry leaders, and they teach you uh, what it is means to be in the forefront of Web3. And unlike other uh, educational courses, uh, you actually get paid to learn. So you get um, $1,000 from our end. We pay you so that you can learn, right? Um, and why? Because why not? If it's uh, possible, like we always think that, uh, you know, uh, it's an opportunity that you you are taking a bet to learn a new technology. So you should be fairly compensated, right? And the idea is to be additive, not extractive. Uh, we also do grant programs and more. Uh, but yeah, here I'd like to talk about uh, some of the fellows um, over the years who have come. Like, uh, yeah, he's an anon. Like. Uh, I mean, no longer goes by his real name, but then he started off as a fellow at our at our hackathons, fellowships, and now is working at uh, a top Web3 protocol. Uh, he also started off as uh, one of our uh, fellows and now is CEO of Stacker Labs. They're doing some good work in the space. and We have uh, more like that, Kushagra and others. All right. Uh, like I said, we also do grant programs. So once you're done with hackathons and fellowships, if you want a grant, to continue building in the space, we offer grants of up to $5,000 in equity-free funding. Um, all right, uh, through our grant program, we have supported 31 projects so far, um, 61,500 in grants and more. And uh, we are currently in the phase two of our grants program. I have 130K in grants to disperse. Um, all right. Um, all right. Come. Coming to something interesting, um, I mean, I think all that we've been doing so far is um, certainly interesting, but in, in a sense, where we were just setting the base for what was supposed to come next. Um, so what we think, um, this is what we think about the future of work. I don't know if you've heard this buzzword being thrown around, um, but if you think about it, right? As devs and builders and designers, where do you go to showcase your work? You go to LinkedIn, you go to Fiverr, and more, right? Um, but all of these platforms um, have their downsides. Um, I'm not going to go much into that. Um, so we are building an integrated system where um, we have immutable on-chain cred, stronger connections, and have an ownership network. Um, all right. So, all right, before I take it ahead, I'd like to just do a quick check in the room. How many of you participate in hackathons? Um, I had one. Okay, so I think, I'm, yeah, this is a um, rare audience that I'm getting to speak to. Um, all right, have you, how many of you have heard of hackathons? All right, uh, anyone in the back? Hackathons? Hackathon, yeah? All right. Uh, for those of you who do not know what hackathons are, they're just um, very simple contests in a way. Um, so there's usually 24 hours or 36 hours to come and build something cool. And in the end, there are prizes if you build something cool. All right. Uh, that's very simple of what hackathons are. Uh, what I want to talk about in context of Web3 um, is what if, so you have your regular hackathon judging process at the end of hackathons. And um, what's interesting is what if hackers could vote for each other uh, for a sort of a community choice program, right? And that is enabled by quadratic voting. Um, there's a mathematical formula that describes uh, quadratic funding. So what happens is that at the end of hackathon, uh, you get 100 votes. Um, you can vote for other projects. We take those votes, uh, put them on the blockchain, um, making them immutable. And then we work backwards to 
uh, plug it into the quadratic funding formula and figure out how much the how the price pool should be dispersed, right? Um, and don't worry if you if I'm not making too much sense. Um, if you go and look it up, uh, there are more than enough blogs on our website. Um, we're also working on on-chain creds. Uh, what that means is that rather than um, trying to um, having your credentials locked in, we do we provide something called soul bound tokens which are like proofs of your uh, achievements on chain uh, if you win a hackathon you get one type of sbt a soul bound token and if you uh, if you just participate you get another type all right um, this is also something interesting that we have uh, recently launched it's kind of proof of backing uh, people like vouching and tipping for each other on chain um, so Let's say you know you have um, somebody big in Web3, or just like um, I don't know who who would be a good builder right now in the world. Like so, for example, if Sam Altman is going through some hackathon projects and he really likes some project, um, he can tip them and leave a message for them, um, saying good job or uh, you know uh, I think this is really cool, and that message actually goes on chain, so it goes on Arbitrum. Um, we also live on base and optimism um, now, and um, yeah, so that's on-chain proof that Sam Altman likes your project, right? And then uh, we have started seeing people use that in their pitch decks and more, right? So that's something cool for us to see. Um, eventually, our goal is to build uh, your one profile and your defolio ID, um, and that being a single source of truth and helps you get access to economic opportunities. Uh, so that's kind of the idea here. Uh, and yeah, if any of you are looking to host hackathons, um, or perhaps just want to talk more about building your community, uh, please reach out to us on Hello at Defolio or follow us on Twitter at Defolio. All right. Um, so that's about it for my talk. I'm going to check. How much time do we have for questions? Um, where is my clock at? Okay, I think we have five minutes. How much time do we have? All right. Um, now, I'm not sure how much sense I made with a lot of this, but um, I mean, let's open it up to questions. And um, yeah, the top three questions, like I said, get one of this and one of this. So. Okay, thank you very much for your very uh, comprehensive and uh, very clear about a marathon project in India. We are admired of the, your maybe fast growth of marathon in India. Maybe some uh, some some uh, some some success success in India. Maybe for maybe last year uh, last three years we we get some information. That's the India take very high growth rates in uh, startup in uh, in in, uh, in the, the, the innovation. So Makathon is one of the most important instrument for India. Yeah. So uh, it is very important. But now in, in Vietnam we just only know Makathon maybe for some reason here. But uh, we need some support from uh, India so we can deliver maybe a wave marathons into Vietnam but uh, the question here what's the condition we are prepared to resist uh, maybe the big way of marathon uh, move from India to Vietnam the first one and for young student now what kind of uh, knowledge skill we prepare to uh, follow this uh, marathon uh, wave and I, you have a chance to provide some scholarship for students, okay? But uh, we, Vietnam and India, is a very close friend. I think you should increase the fellowship and scholarship for Vietnamese students, okay? I will think for your 
yes. uh, the answer. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and yeah, like I said, uh, we are more than happy to help uh, anybody who is trying to uh, host hackathons in uh, in in Vietnam. Um, and uh, it's to be honest now. So we started in India, and but we're not just an Indian. Uh, um, hackathon platform. Now hackathons on Defolio happen globally um, in the US, in Europe, um, even in Southeast Asia, in Korea, um, and um, in Singapore. Um, so we have done one hackathon in Vietnam. Um, so uh, happy to you know collaborate on that. And I think um, the one advantage, I think Vietnam might be similar to India in that sense. So there's a new increasing paradigm, right? Uh, there's no reason why the future of tech should only be built in um, SF. Um, it can be built from anywhere in the world now. And uh, I think Southeast Asia is uh, poised to lead um, this tech revolution. And hackathons are a good way to get um, young devs um, excited. Um, so happy to support any such sort of initiative. We are doing a, a global online Southeast Asia focused hackathon uh, in July. Uh, happy to reach out and talk about it also. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I have one question for you. Uh, uh, I'm a newbie, so uh, uh, I want to uh, know uh, if I want to join a hackathon, what I need to prepare to join a hackathon. Um, I think just um, have a name, have an email ID, and uh, be willing to learn. That's 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 about it, but um, you should like ideally, if you're participating in a hackathon, set a goal for yourself that this is what I want to learn by the time I finish with the hackathon. Uh, because hackathons, to be honest, like your at least your initial hackathons should not be for winning. Uh, hackathons are opportunities to learn and grow, and as long as you learn something new. Um, you will so whatever position you're at. If you absolutely do not know how to code, uh, then your goal should be uh, to build um, a basic website uh, by the end of the hackathon. And then for that, maybe in the lead up to the hackathon, you start learning HTML, CSS, maybe some JavaScript, um, some uh, backend stuff. Um, so that can be a goal, but if you already know how to code for a bit, you can set up a different goal. You can maybe think about working with APIs. You can uh, explore, um, you know, um, you can build like a simple app, whatever you like. So, uh, do you do you like uh, music? Yeah, I like music. Okay, you like music. Okay, so uh, think of a simple uh, project, right? Uh, imagine you could build a project that. Uh, uh, like suggests a song uh, based on um, the weather outside. Yeah. All right. Uh, so if you think about it, how will you do that? You need two data sources. One you need is weather. You need to know what the weather is like outside. Um, and you need music. You need the actual music recommendation. So you can know the weather outside from the weather API. A lot of news uh, outlets publish weather data. So there are a lot of weather APIs. If you don't know what an API is, it's an application programming interface. You can Google it. So you can get data, weather data. You can get music data from Spotify. And then combine that. And it will. you can make a simple app that changes the music as per, or suggests music as per the weather outside. So you keep simple goals like that, and then maybe then as you go through hackathons, you go and take up more and more like ambitious projects, right? Okay, thank you for the sharing. Yeah.
Oh, that's about it. All right. Uh, do we have one time for one more question or no? Oh. <laughs> right. I'm waiting for the next Yes. Question. Yeah, thank you, Denver Disoza, uh, for the wonderful talk and giving insights about hackathon to all the students present over here. And the, even the professor from the academics is very much interested in the hackathon. So thank you. But unfortunately, the gifts have not yet gone. I think I'll take it for myself. <laughs> okay. And now, you know, it's time for the next uh, speaker. Uh, yes, Nirbhik Chauhan is the speaker. And he's the principal multimedia consultant at Centricular Limited. He's a GStreamer maintainer, Genome Foundation member, Mason Build System maintainer, former Gen2 developer. And I sincerely apologize for the delay. Thank you. And it's all your time. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nirbhik. Um, I work for Centricular. I have been a FOSS developer for 18 years now, since 2016. I have contributed to um, to GNOME, uh, Gen2, the Mason build system for the past decade to GStreamer, uh, free and open source multimedia framework. Um, today, I'm here to talk to you about GStreamer um, to give you some insight into how the project is run and how we become a, sustain a financially sustainable and healthy free software community project. Um, GStreamer is a graph-based uh, framework. Um, it can be used and often is used everywhere there is audio or video. Um, TVs, uh, this is like a graph of how to play a file back. You have a file source, you demux it into video and audio, and you play them out. Um, this is used everywhere. You can use audio or video. Um, TVs, smart speakers, doorbells, security cameras, airplanes, satellites, phones, watches, um, drones, broadcasting equipment, radio stations, drilling equipment, desktop applications, mobile apps. It's ubiquitous. All of these companies um, are, are known to uh, use GStreamer, and there's probably more that I haven't heard of. Um, and I stopped putting logos when I got tired yesterday night. Um, so yeah, it's very, very ubiquitously used. But you've probably never heard of it. Um, this is not really probably never heard of it, which is a good thing, um, uh, because uh, middleware should be invisible. Oh, it's, it's could be, it could be pointing toward it or something. So, uh, GStreamer free software, and it was created the same year um, that the movie The Matrix was released. It's a pretty good movie. Um, the year was 1999, when the operating system world was beginning to be consolidated into um, uh, GNU Linux, uh, Solaris, Windows, and the BSDs. The project continued to evolve um, to the 2000s and 2010s, during which the ad general adoption of free and open source software centered, centered around Linux picked up the pace dramatically. It led to, uh, to the world today, where open source has fundamentally just one, and is now the de facto standard for software all across the world. In fact, open source won so hard that every single com software company in the world, including former behemoths like Microsoft and Oracle, have wholeheartedly embraced it. Now, I just said open source, but earlier I described GStreamer as free software. Can anyone here tell me the difference between free software and open source? Anyone? The difference between open source and free software. Well, one difference is that um, licensing is often different. Uh, free software is GPL or MP, um, copyleft license, usually. Open source is more permissive licensing. Another difference is uh, community. Um, free software projects often have, always have, a strong community around them. They're drawn organically, whereas open source software is often just dumped by the company, by a company into a GitHub repository, and there's no community around it. Another difference is um, ownership. There is often a single entity which owns um, usually a company that owns an open source project. Where with the free software project, there will be a community around it, multiple stakeholders, often multiple companies that uh, manage the project. So yes, all of the above are true to some degree. Um, but in my mind, the biggest difference is ideology. Um, free software is an ideology 
that wants to maximize your freedom to control the software that you use. In a nutshell, the idea is that if you have access to the source code and you have the ability to modify it, you control the software. The most visceral example of the importance of this uh, is people who have implanted, who have medical devices implanted into their bodies, um, like pacemakers, for instance. Karen Sandler, um, the executive, the former executive director of the GNOME Foundation, has one such device inside of her, a pacemaker. And she has talked extensively about the issues around her lack of control of this device and hence her own body. Um, in the glorious victory of open source over proprietary software, this freedom seems to have been forgotten. You know, such is the nature of life. Um, times change, the, world, the needs of the world change. The creators change and users change. Cultural context changes. Now, the streamer as a project has undergone a lot of necessary changes over time. It started out as a framework just for playing audio and video files in the GNOME desktop project. But it is now a completely different beast, capable of handling every multimedia need that the world has today. However, we have not forgotten our roots, and we continue to work with the GNOME project. And I'm a GNOME Foundation member myself. At the same time, our existence and evolution of the project, of the project uh, continues, and the last 15 years have shown that our model is fully sustainable. And I want to be clear about the meaning of the word sustainable here. By sustainable, I mean that the project has grown over time, accrued new members, embraced new technologies, and new sectors, such as the proliferation of browsers for app development, um, machine learning and AI, autonomous vehicles, remote controlled vehicles, ultra low latency devices, and so on. And all in a way that, um, that uh, with a way to fund the maintainers that keeps the maintenance and control of the project. So this is what, so what, so what is this model that has led to sustainability and most importantly, financial freedom? Isn't funding uh, or the development of uh, open source uh, of maintenance of host projects a challenging topic? Yes, it is. I think, uh, but I think it's a proposition that most people haven't considered. Just last week, um, a chilling supply chain attack was attempted on the FOSS ecosystem as a whole. A sleeper agent, um, style of back uh, of attack was attempted that tried to add a backdoor to every Linux machine in the world. Almost sounds like something from a spy movie, right? Um, how many of you have heard of this? This thing called the executors attack. Okay. Well, it was widely reported. And um, I won't go into the details, but it fundamentally relied on the pervasive fund funding problem that the, that the FOSS ecosystem has. Um, the maintainer of a critical uh, free software project called Xutils, which is basically a compression utility, um, did not have enough time to spend on the project. And they had a lot of pressure on them to continue to um, maintain the project. And suddenly, out of nowhere, somebody showed up and said, I'll, I'll be happy to help as a maintainer. Um, and they spent the next two or three years building up trust with the project. At the end of that, um, when they had built enough trust with the former maintainer, they, once they got the keys to the project, so to speak, once they had enough permissions, they tried to insert a backdoor into a release. And if that had succeeded, the large majority of Linux systems out there would have uh, had a backdoor in them and would have had access uh, by this person. The current best guess is that the attack was funded by some national uh, intelligence agency, by some state actor, but we don't know for sure. They were caught because of the obsessive nature of false contributors. That makes them really hard, that makes it really hard to ship uh, a nefarious change and have it be deployed around, around across the world. In my view, this incident was both a shining example of the passionate quality um, of people constituting the FOSS ecosystem. And it was also a critical failure of ours in failing to fund the people who constitute the ecosystem that we all rely on today. This is not an unknown problem, but it, was, it is a relatively new one, um, one that the movement did not foresee. We wanted the FOSS movement to, movement to succeed. We wanted the whole world to run on free software, and it has now. But we failed to, we, became, we can be successful. We couldn't foresee some of the consequences. In a nutshell, our movement is, is no longer a hobby. It has become too big for that. And the only sustainable way to continue is for maintainers to work full time on it and hence be funded. But taking a step back, how is it, how is the thing? How can you have too much success? Isn't this strange that this is a problem? Our world uh, 
the systems of our world um, are built are built in such a way that if you if there's an incredible demand for something and you supply it, you're rewarded for it. And the people have spoken. They do want FOSS software. So why do we have a funding problem in FOSS? Is it because we want to um, is it because we want to give away software for no cost? Some people do think that. And on the surface, this seems true. After all, if you get something away for free, how can you make money off it, right? But one counter example is that every single website, almost every single website on the internet that you visit is for free, but they're still making money. So it's not that you can't make money if you give your product away for free. It's just that you can't make money selling a product in that case. So what can you sell? Again, uh, the way to answer that question is by asking, what do people want? Um, let me, let's say I give you all the parts, all the components of a car to you right now for free. Can you build the car yourself? No, of course not. What if I give you the specifications and the design for each and every component of that? Will you be able to build the car now? No, you won't be able to build the car. Of course not. Um, you need somebody who understands all the components and is an expert and can, and can help you build it. Did you know that patterns um, are designed to be a complete description of a system in such a way that you can build it from scratch? Not meant to be like an all-encompassing description which allows you to prevent other people from building what you have built. This is a lesser known fact. Even lesser known is the fact that despite having a patent, you cannot rebuild the system from scratch because there's a lot of tribal knowledge and um, there's always experience that is only in the heads of the people who are working on these things. So you need expertise to build anything. And I think this is a point that is enormously, enormously underestimated by technical people because technical people are are the experts. And if you know something is obvious to you, you not understand how much value it has to people who, for whom it's not obvious. And you see this all the time. People always undervalue their own expertise in other contexts. But companies will always need the help of experts to put together components that make up the products that they want to sell. And there's a name for this kind of uh, business. It's called a software services consultancy. Right? And this is exactly what Centricular does, the company that I work for. And Egalia, and Colabra, and Asymptotic, and many others who are stakeholders in the GStreamer community. I'll see just the four biggest consultancies here. The critical thing here, what you need, is some way to bridge the gap between the business end, who talks to users, who gets paid by users to ship products to them, and the FOSS community which has the technology that the businesses and the users need. And I work with Centricular, and the company consists entirely of GStreamer open source maintainers. We've all been working on GStreamer for years, in some cases decades. And the entire purpose of our company is to fund the development of GStreamer through a consultancy. And so that we can do the work that no one wants to pay for, which is to be maintainers, to maintain the project. We were founded in 2013. We've existed for over a decade now. We worked with over 300 companies uh, in the past uh, 11 years. And the team is tiny. It's just 13 people as of last month. And I would say that out of this, um, for the most of our life, we've only had about seven or eight people. And my experience over the past decade has convinced me that the ideal way to fund yourself is providing something that, the pe that people will want to pay you money for. Not something you're doing out of the goodness of their heart or out of charity, but because they, their business depends on it. And it allows you to be fully in control of your future. If the people, um, your users want something different, they'll get in touch with you. You'll have, you have basically your, uh, your finger on the pulse of the market and of what people want. That means you'll stay relevant for as long as you want. But this solution needs an additional special source for success. And the ingredient is community ownership. The project must not must be owned by the community and not a single entity. Note how Centricular is not the only consultancy um, that works on GStreamer. This is the project is extremely multi-stakeholder, and I think this is this is extremely key to the uh, health of a project. Because if we have a single uh, if you if you have a single uh, source or single ownership of the project, inevitably somebody will try to um, it'll begin a, it'll 
they'll take discussions private. It will become divorced from the community. They'll add a CLA or they change the license. Even most recently, for instance, Redis did this. They made all of their um, code source available. So now people are forking it instead. That's really bad for the community. It immediately kills the whole community. You don't want that. So you have to have multiple stakeholders. Because in this case, if any one company tried to do this, the rest would continue on. And that one company would be alone. And they would not succeed. So it basically is a check against a bad actor in the community. But that's not the only reason why um, it's not the only reason why having um, a company-based structure is important for your comp for your open uh, source project. Another reason is replacement rate. So projects um, people are going to leave the project. You will have attrition. Right? Um, people are going to move on. People will pass away. People will get busy, and you need to have new contributors coming in continuously to the project. And the so in open source projects, people have tried many things. People have tried to do Google Summer of Code. People have tried to do Outreachy, and they have had limited success. Um, the reason for that is that open source maintainers is it, that it relies upon the labor of unpaid open source maintainers, which are already overworked. So it's quite a difficult model for success. But as a company, you have more options. You are already paying your developers, your maintainers. It's very easy to hire somebody as an intern, right? And just have them come into the community. You can indoctrinate them um, because you, they're young people, and you can teach them about the project. They can have them care about the project, care about the project. And as time grows, they will, and the time comes, they'll take over the mantle. And I sincerely believe that this model can work in more places than it is being used right now. And I think the reason it's not being tried is because uh, as software developers, as technical people, as engineers, um, we are fundamentally blind to uh, the business way of thinking. And sometimes there's a person, maybe one in 10, who does have business, a mind for business. And, um, and my message is to these people. Um, if, uh, just, if you think that you can think outside of the box of the developer, please, please try this model. Um, it won't work with every project. And I can tell you what are some necessary conditions for its success. But it's, I think, a model that can be replicated. So to summarize, force funding is a big problem in our community. It's the underpinning of our ecosystems. And we have to find a way to fund different things, different, uh, to fund it. The main thing proposed, and my proposal is that you have to self-fund. And if your project is um, a project that can be self-funded, you should try it. Um, you want to, if you can't sell your software, which, and you shouldn't sell your software, you should sell your expertise. People do need it. You, you have spent years on the project. And uh, you know it better than anybody else. And companies do want that. So just from anecdotal evidence, I have so many projects that I know of where companies want to find a way to um, fix issues with it because they're using it. They don't know who to get in touch with. So they're just sitting around and being, OK, I guess I can try doing it myself. They don't have expertise themselves. And eventually, after a few years of trying to find somebody to work on it, they just move on to something else. Um, you have to protect your company via multiple stakeholders. Um, if you start a company, try to encourage other people to start a company within it. But, uh, but otherwise, if you are your own company, try not to you know, go the way of Redis or other companies like that. Um, the com and, the and the community must own the project. The um, trademarks and the assets must be owned by a foundation or some other legal entity which is independent of your company. Um, finally, you must grow the project. You have to recruit the youth because um, as times change over a period of, let's say, eight years, nine years, um, you will not be necessarily in touch with what everybody is using and what people need or what people want. And um, have, getting new blood is important for um, having perspective. And the necessary conditions that you need for, to apply this model are these three. First, the project must be a component or consist of components that companies can, be, can use to build product products. Um, this applies to a lot more products, uh, projects than you might think. Um, in fact, a lot of talks that were done at this conference today uh, and yesterday and day before, um, they have talked, they have mentioned, they have talked, they have been about projects that fit this bill very well. Second, ideally, it should be copyleft because a lot of the times, um, a barrier to entry that company that developers face, developers inside companies face, is that um, the companies don't want to share their work 
But if it's already required, they legally require to share the work, then they're more likely to approach an external entity for help with the project. Um, finally, the project must already be well known and of good quality. Um, I, this is not a recipe for making your project successful or starting up a project. If your project is already well known, then this is a model that you can apply. Um, so yeah, summary is this. These are the requirements. And um, please go ahead and try it um, if you fit, think the project fits this bill and you are well aware of it. And um, that's what I'm here to tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Nirbik, for the wonderful talk. Questions. And giving more insights. Yeah, if you have any questions, you can freely ask them. No questions? Sure. Thank you. Yes, thank you. As it's an international conference, now we have translation in Vietnamese. So basically, you exposed uh, that having an open governance model with several stakeholders and company was critical for open source. But as an open source user, uh, which kind of guarantee uh, can I have that the project is really run uh, in an open governance model? How can we enforce such a thing? So, the way you would, as a user, enforce it is through the threat of going somewhere else. Um, if you see, like, the, the, good, the good thing about open governance and open um, community is that you can see it happening. They usually talk on discourse or matrix or IRC or discord, or something like that. And if you see that this is not happening, um, then you can reduce your, um, your alignment with the project. It's fundamentally, all alliances and all friendships are about alignment. If you if you are uh, prior and your incentives align with the company or with the project, then you should continue with them. And you should always be in mind that if they stop aligning because the com the community is starting to die out or the company is trying to take advantage of the com project, then you should be like, okay, my uh, my um, align time is, uh, my uh, incentives don't align with yours, and I'm going to take my work elsewhere. I'm going to fork it or something like that. So you have that power as a user, and that is a threat you should definitely enforce on companies because companies should be afraid of you, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So, bye. Yeah, I can present myself. Nice to meet you, everybody. I'll just I'm give an intro about you. Yes. I'm a moderator, I'll do the job for you. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Nidbik. And now, you know, we have a talk on Open Standard JMAP, the new generation email protocol by Benoit, Benoit Tellier. He's a general manager of Linagora Vietnam. Benoit has been part of the Apache James community since 2015. His motto is a modular email system that scales using modern protocols, a contributor since 2016, and a project committee member since 2017. He became the chairman of the Apache James project in 2019 and a member of Apache Foundation in 2020. Benoit has participated in several IETF meetings, collaborating with other project members to propose two RFCs to the JMAP working group. Additionally, Benoit has flourished with the Inagora group for the past 10 years, where he currently serves as a product owner for the team mail solution and as open source program officer. He is now back in France, based in Loin, after spending the last eight years in Hanoi as the general manager of Linagora Vietnam. I welcome you, Benoit, for the presentation. Yes, you're most welcome. And 
Yeah. The stage is open for you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. So um, let's get starting. So welcome to this talk about email protocols. As a first thing, deep in my heart, I want to be building something open, something that everybody can use and that don't enslave you to a specific technological vendor. So that's Linagora vision since 2000, so for over 24 years. And we believe that on that, we can build together uh, ethical software solution that benefits us all. Who amongst you have an email address? Who amongst you sent an email today? Today? No, not sure. It's still early. We'll send an email today. <laughs> okay, long live email. Email is here to stay. My mother use it. My grandmother use it. Maybe not everybody grandma, but... Uh, Everybody use it. Uh, where is your email address? Uh, Gmail? Okay, mine need to. Okay, me, I've got a personal email address at Gmail, a company email address on linagora.com. Gstreamer, you have an, your own email address, and we are on different system but I can still send you an email. That's very different from WhatsApp, Signal, all these crazy messaging applications that cannot communicate together. And that, but I can answer when I want to an email. I don't need to be acting upon it right now. Email is here to stay. That's what I believe. And our mission at Linagora is to give a communication tool for people to continue doing email in 2024, 2025, and so on and so on. So to be doing that in an open fashion, we need to be using open standards for doing that. Who can give me the name of an email protocol in the room? Yes? I'm up SMTP, okay, yes, here we go. So that's email 101. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that the room is very technical, so we'll need to go down to this. Bob sends an email to Alice. Bob has his email server. Alice has her email server. Bob uses simple mail transfer protocol to send an email to his server. While wow, Alice is not here, where is Alice's email server? We do a DNS lookup, we find the server, we use SMTP to transfer the mail, and then Alice reads it, not with POP, but with IMAP. Great. What's wrong with that? Huh? Well, not my problem. There's great tools like AirSpamD to actually fight that. You plug AirSpamD just here before receiving things and problem solved. <laughs> Don't pollute my talk. When was IMAP created? 80s-ish, yeah. Uh, last revision is from the 90s, but yeah. IMAP is a very old protocol, so now, for instance, actually the picture looks like that. If we are using webmails, we need to have a custom HTTP proxy layer to translate IMAP into whatever uh, web stuff that we actually need. And IMAP is an old protocol. It's complex. It's line-based. Parsing is awful. It's connected. It's very chatty. It's per mailbox, so I need to always select and select, switch things, na 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 na. Uh, I can go a long, long time uh, listing very technical stuff on why IMAP is not any longer adapted to today needs. Maybe it was in the 80s, but 
Since then, we learned a lot about crafting efficient protocols. And that's the point. Today, email usage did change. We, I have, I have this pocket, a phone, a laptop, a tablet, a desktop at home. So just me, I use four devices. And everybody is getting an email address. I'm expecting to see my mail the same way on my phone and on my laptop, real time. I'm expecting all this kind of things. And that's very expensive to do that well with IMAP. So big tech giants did actually do their own thing by their side with MAPI uh, protocol, Gmail API. Uh, the list is long. That's where, w about the time we started thinking about having our email solution, and we looked at what is being done in open source. We thought, okay, we are not just redesigning yet another webmail proxy. That's not for us. We are more ambitious than that. We want to be part of a global initiative to design email protocols 2.0, the new protocol for reading your emails. And that's how we started contributing within the IETF to an initiative called JMAP, JSON Metadata Application Protocol. So basically what JMAP is, it's IMAP 2.0, so based on common technologies like HTTP, JSON, everybody knows that, leverage um, real time in the core spec, leverage good resynchronization primitives within the core spec, leverage something that allows you to combine requests together, a bit like GraphQL, into the core specification. And all of that makes you a super efficient, stateless, easy to cache protocol built on common tools, right? You can have all the HTTP tooling of the world that you want on top of it, easy to integrate. So JMAP, I've been on the design stage for the four years and based on the exchange, the consensus built within the Internet Engineering Task Force we came to a final RFC in 2019. So I have a little demo. I'm sorry, today I won't be doing a live demo. I will be going at the end of the slide deck to show you how JMAP is working. So the first thing with JMAP, it's getting the session object. The session object will tell you which JMAP extension is supported and allow you to discover all the several settings and limitations. No more guessing like with IMAP and SMTP. Once you get that, you get your JMAP endpoints. The very next thing that you do is get a list of email, right? Because we need to be displaying on the left panel, you see Twake mail, so that's the JMAP email client that we've been doing. And here on the right panel, you see a JMAP query. So we've got an email query that allows us to get a list of identifiers, well, true, unique, immutable, per object identifier, something that we actually lack in IMAP. It sounds stupid to say that, but we are lacking it. And then we are chaining this with a back reference to an email get call. And this allows us to get here the result of the email query, that is a list of identifier. And then chained with the email get, we are having all the list of the metadata in one call that we need to actually display our web mail list of email. Right. Once we have that, it is easy to resynchronize. We have another method that is called slash changes. 
right? So you see there's a common trend. You have generic method names and you have entity. So here, email is the entity and slash changes is the generic method name. So it works the same for mailboxes, for identities, for email submission. So all the JMAP entities work the same. And slash changes, I give it the state and I will be able to collect everything that did change. So here, no changes. And I would be able to pipe it with an email get method to actually directly get all the metadata of the item that did change and update my view in one call, in one API call. Then I click on the email. Whoa, it opens. I can read that whatever this guy did, it's not security, okay, whatever. But what you should notice is that then I pass in more properties and I get the email server doing the parsing for me and returning me a nice JSON, including the HTML body. And on the front end side, I don't need to be doing any MIME parsing, no MIME parsing at all. So I can plug a team that is not doing email, doing my front end. As a project manager, I love it. Okay, and then uh, you've got off-band download and upload uh, for your big binary files, right? And this is how sending an email looks like. So on the right, uh, left, left, you've got the composer of Twake Mail, so rich text composer, uh, spent quite a bunch of time doing that. And on the right, you see that you have a call for creating the email with email set, and we are piping it with email submission set so that actually we end up sending the email. I won't be demoing uh, the real time stuff, uh, but basically simple server sent events and stuff like that. Touch. So basically being part of a new protocol is an awesome adventure. We are reviewing uh, the standards, we are implementing standards amongst the first one to implement them. And uh, sometimes we encounter functional needs that don't yet get a standard. So then we share our extensions and some of them eventually become standards of their own. I can give you the example of read receipts, but we also did the same for Quota. So really involved into the IETF community. Last but not least, open standards is important. We need to have a diversified network of companies contributing to our software. So basically, on the server part, we are contributing to Apache James, the email server of the Apache Software Foundation. And we are reusing a project to actually build one of our products. So Apache James brings storage uh, primitives, brings modularity, brings email standards, and we are reusing that core project to actually develop a product called Twake Mail, which is built on top of Apache James brings in our custom collaborative features and extensions, right? We have some proof of concept with uh, encrypted PGP data at rest kind of stuff that's part of Twake Mail and integrations with our ecosystem. But it's a double thing. We also don't need to push all of these things into the core project because we have Twake Mail. So that's how we can link our two talks together. <laughs> and uh, so on the back end side, uh, with James, we are taking the approach that in the end, an email server is an online service like anything today. So we can rely on a central database. Well, that scale thanks to NoSQL with Cassandra as a metadata base. 
uh, with open search for distributed search, with S3 for storing big data stuff, RabbitMQ for messaging, right? And then we just manage an email server like any massively scaling services that we have today, no longer sharding and stuff like that. So we did also rework uh, the core architecture of an email server and integrate it with modern cloud technologies like Kubernetes, uh, Prometheus, and, and so on and so on. And on top of that, we did develop, and I did already show it to you, you've been seeing screenshots, a mobile application based on Flutter, so it's cross-platform, not only Android, iOS, but also the web application, the web mail, so built with Flutter cross-platform. You can use Twake Mail front-end with any JMAP server. You just need to be finding a JMAP server. Hopefully, Linagora is not the only service provider. So us, it's mostly today on-premise. Uh, email server deployment. We've been, for instance, deploying that for 10,000 lawyers in France just last month. There's over there's people, also there's people that are open source and part of the overall JMAP community. So some of them should be pretty well known to people of the assistance. Some of them are some big telecom provider some of them are a bit less well-known. So I don't know if there is a lot of email guys in the room, but I wish I did convince you that uh, JMAP is the future and that you need to develop what you need to integrate JMAP into your email products. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Do you have question? Yeah. Thank you very much. Do anyone have question? Hi. Um, so. I've heard that Fastmail is also working on um, their own um, uh, their own, their own channel for email as well, something called Courier. Is that a competitor? Are they collaborating with you? What is that? Fastmail? Yeah. I would say Fastmail is a partner. The email market is big. We don't have, we don't target the same persona. Uh, Lina Cora historically is French and mostly focused on the French market. So uh, with a sovereignty speech, we speak about data sovereignty and data would need for our customer to be hosted at least in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we do actually see fast mail people quite a lot. Uh, for example, I saw Ricardo at uh, FOSDEM earlier this year we share the same fight, which is have a wider uh, JMAP adoption. We have some disagreements. Uh, I'm very glad for them contributing JMAP into Cyrus. But Cyrus is only a mail delivery agent, and uh, Fastmail did not open source their code for mail submission, which I'm quite fed up with. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I would say overall partner. We Thank share the same fight. Thank you. I have one more question. Um, you mentioned that um, the protocol is more is leaving more work for the server and less for the client. And one part of you are showing the screenshots. You showed something that indicated that the server is doing more parsing and the client doesn't have to guess sort of thing. Could you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, of course. So. Email is a complex topic, and everybody come with his little spec, making it full of uh, complicated edge case corner. And uh, that's for, for a first problem. The second problem is that 
if I'm passing uh, the email. So writing without help, writing an email application is a very complex topic. That's number one. Number two, depending on what you are doing, you might need to download uh, the full email blob to actually be acting upon it as a client, which is okay if you've got an offline uh, IMAP client like from the bird, which is not okay if you are doing a web mail or something. So basically, um, Basically, it simplifies this a lot by saying that it's the server responsibility. And uh, to be fairly honest, it don't take that much compute resources on the server side. Uh, I would say my workload is, if I look at the server CPU, one third protocol uh, getting uh, data in and out to the customer, to the client one third accessing it from the database layer, and maybe one third in the middle doing this advanced JMAP stuff. It's a cost that we can pay. And uh, again, then you can have lighter applications onto the client side. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you can also put take people that never don't know what an email is and ask them to develop uh, an email application. They just need to understand how the protocol works. They don't need to care about multi-part, inline, alternative, na 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 na, and all the complex stuff. Makes sense. Thank you. I, when my um, email client currently at a company we use IMAP, and whenever um, I am on a question, it's a little slow, or even just normally in India because the server is in the UK. It's usually if I do too many actions, it just takes half an hour to finish the job. So I'm really happy to see a project, uh, a new protocol that can batch and can do operations in a single API call instead of having like multiple API calls for multiple actions. So really looking forward to a future where we can get rid of IMAP. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And we have another one more question. Yes. Hi. So my question is whether you found uh, at least one big ISP or mailbox provider that wants JMAP, because that's the problem we have. And I work for Open Exchange. We make Dovecot, which is the leading IMAP uh, server. And we've been having JMAP support on our list for like six, seven years. But then we never find anyone that wants it. So the free software community doesn't want it. When you ask which features do you want, they ask for other things. And the commercial customers, like the very big ISPs, say, no, we're fine with IMAP. We don't want to rewrite our clients. So we don't, so we don't need JMAP. So I mean, we, we, we want to do it. But the, so did you find some demand in the market? Because that's the problem we have. So the chicken egg problem, I think at mail is the good answer to that. The problem is that you need some kind of vertical integration, I would say, to own at the same time uh, the server space and the client space uh, to actually uh, be able to push JMAP. Uh, I think that uh, it's not necessarily the case for big ISPs. Uh, I, I must confess I don't know Exchange that much. I guess that you have your custom alternative to JMAP for the webmail, more or less. We generally do everything with IMAP. So we have uh, the, the webmail and Dovecot and, yeah, uh, and some a, a, a bit of extensions maybe for and, the commercial and customer. The uh, but the yeah, by the way, at the ITF, there's also the new extension for IMAP. So the, the, I think even the ITF is developing JMAP. And I mean, I go to the ITF. There's a meeting of JMAP for half an hour, and then the same people become meeting of IMAP version 4. So it's like they're, they, they don't know which one they want to push. Yeah, yeah. But I think the answer would be uh, for the people running Open Exchange. If you are able to push JMAP across the stack, you will be reducing the uh, cloud bill uh, for your customer. Uh, so I think that's where it should start. But they have something that is already profitable enough, already running, stability. So, uh, but that, that's a discussion that we did had at uh, FOSDEM. Uh, Dave, maybe, I don't remember the name, but uh, basically, yeah, that's maybe the next big moving thing into the JMAP ecosystem 
is the new protocol modularity making it into Thunderbird. So it's not impossible that we've got a big email client starting making the JMAP move. And uh, with that, maybe dominoes will start falling, hopefully. Uh, what I can say is developing a new solution, being able to do it on my side with just JMAP, I leverage the knowledge and expertise from other people within the IETF. And uh, clearly, we would not have been able to come up with such a great protocol by ourselves just at Linagora. Thank you very much. So such a great interaction, Benoit. And yes, thank you. We'll end the session. And all of you, we have a lunch break at 1.30 PM. And so I request all of you to enjoy the lunch. We'll be back by 1.30 PM. We have very great sessions and talks uh, regarding to open WISP and secure print experience, smart home ecosystem using open source, and you know open source and open data opportunity and we have many things ask me anything with roger and so i request all of you to come back by 1:30 after lunch thank you all of you yes thank you